Right. <clears throat> it being 6 p.m., I'll declare open the 30th of November Ordinary Council meeting of the Shire of Capel. We wish to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land we are meeting on, the Wadani people. We wish to acknowledge and respect their continuing connection to the land, waters and community. We pay our respects to all members of the Aboriginal communities and their culture and to their elders past and present, their descendants who are with us today and those who will follow in their footsteps. Record of attendance, uh, we have eight councillors in attendance tonight with an apology from Councillor Rosina Mogg. Response to previous public questions taken on notice are included in tonight's agenda. So we now move to public question time. We have a few questions on notice. First, Mr Mike Norton. Thank you, Karen. Thank you, Mr Chairman. Uh, Mike Norton, WA Farmers Vast Zone Chairperson. <coughs> Can WA Farmers have an update on the pending contractual upgrades to the Boyne Up sale yards that cover animal welfare, environmental licences and conditions which apply to that particular site, traffic management, workplace conditions which apply to yard staff and vendors wishing to visit the sale yard site? Have all the above licences been agreed to and signed off on by all parties and the various government departments involved and be available for public discussion and input? Uh, bearing in mind that uh, this whole process has been going on since the 1st of July 2022. Thank you, Mr Chairman. Thank you for your question, Mr Norton. Yes, the Shire can confirm that the conditions precedent, the capital upgrade and operations plan set by the Council, have been satisfied and agreed with WALSA following an extensive no negotiation period process that involved all relevant agencies. Now that the conditions have been satisfied, the signing of the new lease will occur in the coming days and short weeks. The new operational plan is already in place, with WALSA already having made significant changes to their operations to improve animal welfare, staff workplace health and safety and traffic management that includes the earlier sale times to avoid the hottest parts of the day reduced pen stocking rates, data loggers in the pens to monitor heat, upgraded access to drinking water for animals, stock inspectors and agency officers in attendance at each sale, new ablutions for staff and customers, improved traffic management through separation of trucks and vehicles, as well as the closure of an internal road to local through traffic. The proposed capital upgrade works will now be subject to a normal development application process which includes public advertising and consideration of any submissions by the Council. Do we have a date on that being advertised, Mr Chairman or CEO? The Chief Executive Officer. Uh, through you, Shire President, subject to Welsh um, pro pro submitting the relevant development applications and the Shire then going through the statutory process, but where hoping that the first development application, which will be focused on the shade shelters, um, will be um, occurring as soon as possible. We, but ultimately, the submission of it is, is for Walsford to provide us with the application. But it will be soon. OK, thank you, Mr CEO. Second question, Mr Chairman. Has the Cable Shire started the process of forming a committee <coughs> or working group with, with staff or councillors or southwest livestock producers to agree to the proposed relocation site for the Boyne Up Sale Yards? Uh, the new Boyne Up Sale Yard facility should be accessible to all livestock agents in WA with a funding management model that covers the whole of the industry, not just to livestock agents with a monopoly. Uh, the facility has to meet all current uh, community expectations relating to animal welfare, environmental, occupational health and welfare s uh, safety standards, which of course the current site doesn't. Sure. Thank you, Mr Norton. Uh, yes, the Shire has been working with the Department of Primary Industries and Regional Development on the development of a draft scope of works for the identification of potential sites to relocate the Boyne Up sale yards from the town site and that will also consider an expanded agribusiness precinct. This investigation process will be headed by a steering committee that will be led by the Shire and include government agencies and a broad range of industry representatives. Expressions of interest for the 
industry representative as to be part of the steering committee will be sought in early new year. Very good. <coughs> early or mid new year or? Yeah. Early. Early. January, February. Okay, and, and that'll be made public for pe people to, or organisations to apply for a, a position yeah. on the steering committee. We will committee. advertise that seeking expressions of interest. And you'll have the final say on who goes on or who doesn't, not the agents? The committee will be headed by the Shire, so we'll yeah. you'll, you'll have oversight of that. Yeah. Thank you very much, Mr Chairman and Councillors. Thank you. Uh, next question is from Michael Titchbon, but I, Donna Brown, I assume, is asking on his behalf. Um, good evening, um, President, CEO and councillors. Um, this question is from Michael Titchbon. Last Thursday, the Shire advised of an EIL application, PA 166, of this year on Plantation Road, Ludlow, to be determined by the Regional Joint Development Assessment Panel, the DAP. As this application does not appear to comply with the Shire of Cables Extractive Industries Local Law 2016, which was gazetted on 2nd November 2016, on extractive industries licences in respect to three matters, only 5.5 of a metre separation above maximum groundwater level instead of the gazetted two metres, a setback of 20 metres from roadway instead of the gazetted 40 metres, and no distance from wetland instead of the gazetted 50 metres. Michael's two questions. Question one, what enforcement authority does the Shire's local law have in regard to required compliance or does the, our, the JDAP override the Shire's local law? Thank you, Ms Brown, for the questions on behalf of Michael Titchborn. The Regional Development Assessment Panel process is not a matter in which an applicant can circumvent the Shire's extractive industry local laws. It is recognised that the above requests are inconsistent with the Shire's local law requirements. However, the Shire is seeking to introduce a comprehensive performance-based local planning policy to guide the appropriateness of development for extractive industries. This is before the Council to consider this evening. The Shire can only provide a recommendation to the Regional Joint Development Assessment Panel through a responsible authority report the Shire would seek to provide a recommendation that is consistent with its base standards, being those outlined in the local law or any other relevant planning policies the Shire may have. The Shire will be obtaining further legal advice to guide decision making in the scenario that the, RJ, that the Regional Development Assessment Panel approves an extractive industry development that may contradict the Shire's local laws. Thank you. Question two, on the volume of sand proposed to be extracted, it doesn't appear to warrant a regional JDAP hearing. Does this proposal comply with the minimum value of a project to be granted by a regional JDAP hearing? The Shire is obtaining legal advice on the thresholds associated with the minimum $2 million development cost to opt into the Regional Development Assessment Panel process. We are, however, aware that the value of a project we are aware, sorry, we are however aware of the value of the project and are disputing the operational costs forming part of the overall development cost. Thank you. Thank you. Mr Kim Payne. Yeah, Kim Payne, 45 Cane Road, Boyne Up Plains. This is to do with the dreaded feedlot. That's the Kingston Rest feedlot for those who don't know. I quote Alerting and Associates 5.0 page 19. The odour assessment models the proposed facility only based upon the assumption that the existing facilities will be decommissioned once the feedlot facility is fully operational. Mr Garston has previ previously stated this area is too wet for sheep, so he sought permission to build raised floor roof structures, structures to contain the sheep. At the recent RJDAP meeting, we learned from one seemingly more informed 
JDAP member, 20,000 sheep will still occupy land outside of the sheds. Contrary to alerting and associates, DPIRDS, and I suspect other departments' expectations. This will void all calculations made for this already deficiently assessed proposal. My question, now 47,750 sheep are to be involved, <coughs> will the Shire councillors instruct the planning department to revisit this obnoxious, flawed proposal? Thank you for your question, Mr Payne. The Joint Development Assessment Panel is an independent decision-making body and the Shire's role is, provide, is to provide the responsible authority report. The JDAP has made the decision to approve the stock feedlot and there is no statutory planning mechanisms to enable the Shire to re have the proposal reconsidered or revisited. Thank you. Question two. Given that alerting and associates assumed no sheep outside of the raised floor shedded pens. Did Shire planning staff seek assurance from Kingston Rest of the correctness of that assumption? And if not, why not? The livestock housed in paddocks were associated with an existing approval, with an existing approval. This new proposal was assessed thoroughly by the Shire on the basis of the application submitted to the JDAP and then was considered by the panel on its planning merits. Thank you. <coughs> Mr. Brian Hastie. <coughs> Brian Hastie, 1253 Bustle Highway, Stratton. Uh, just a quick, quick um, background. When I was a kid, Hastie's Road was named Hastie Road, H A S T I E. And I lived in Dolora um, growing up as a kid. Anyway, under item 14.1 of tonight's council meeting, the council have the opportunity, under the nomination of the new ro road names affected by the Bunbury Outer Ring Road, in brackets bore, to make a submission to Landgate and have Hasty's Road reverted back to its original and proper name being Hasty Road. And I asked the council tonight to please change the name back to Hasty Road. Thank you. Thank you for your question, Mr Hasty. The item 14.1 you are referring to is a decision on road names affected only by the Bunbury Ring Road. The Shire has discussed the naming history of Hasty's Road with Landgate, who have, who have advised us that there has been no change to the spelling of the road name since originally approved in July 1974 as Hasty's Road. Um, I would debate that and say in 2009 I, said, I, I sat for council and under um, the, the sign on Hasty Road and Corner Bustle, Bustle Highway and, um, and um, Hasty's Road in Delora, it was H-A-S-T-I-E, Hasty Road, as I have here, Hasty sure. Road. Sure. Th thank you, Mr Hasty. We'll, um, we'll take that on advisement, but um, the information we have been provided says that is the correct spelling as of 1974. Oh, I, won't, I won't be stopping until I get it changed. Thank you, Mr Hastings. Uh, there are all the questions on notice. Were there any questions from the floor? Uh, Dr Don Finlay. Uh, good evening. Uh, just a question for uh, the Shire CEO regarding the uh, uh, very recent announcement here at the meeting of the agreement between the parties on the going up sales yards. Can he disclose whether that's a 10 year or a 20 year lease agreement? The Chief Executive Officer. Uh, through you, Shire President. Thank you, Mr. Finlay. The decision that Council made back in February. Um, was for the lease to be a 10-year agreement <coughs> with the WA Livestock Association. The new lease will be a 10-year agreement in accordance with that decision. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Uh, Ms Bronwyn Mutton. Hello, good evening, uh, Mr President, Mr CEO and Councillors. Uh, I had this letter I thought was um, 
I presented to you on my behalf. I was in Perth yesterday, so I'm given um, Talia a, a copy, signed copy before the meeting. My question this evening is regarding the possible unauthorised clearing in the Shire. Commencing in May 2022, five reports of possible illegal clearing against one property were made to Pollution Watch, Department of Water and Environmental Regulation, DWER. After the first report, the alleged offender was sent a, cop a letter of education by DWER. However, the clearing continued over a period of several months, resulting in four more reports to DWER, including two of those complaints being lodged by the Shire of Cable. A response was received from Pollution Watch on the 23rd of November 2022, advising that DWER intends to take no action other than a formal letter of warning. This alleged illegal clearing does not seem to be exempt under the five hectares a year rule, which has specific limitations. Please refer to the native vegetation fact sheet. Uh, I've given the details there with the numbers. A guide to the exemptions and regulations for clearing native vegetation. Under part five of the Environmental Protection Act, 1986, pages 12 and 13, August 2019. Question one, does the Shire of Capel intend to lodge a complaint with the Minister for the Environment requesting that some stronger action be taken regarding illegal clearing, both generally and in this instance, as the department policy at this time will only encourage unauthorised clearing of the diminishing areas of native vegetation in the Shire of Capel? Thank you, Ms. Mutton, for the question. Um, thank you for submitting your questions to us, but given that they were presented to us so close to the council meeting, we couldn't take them on notice. Okay. Um, but we have received that, so we can include that. Um, in relation to your question, we'll, we'll take that on notice. Okay, thank um, you. Given there's a, quite a bit of information. Okay, for that one. thank you. So my question two is, will the Shire agree to undertake an awareness campaign, both written and via the Shire of Capel social media platforms to raise awareness that clearing of native vegetation must comply with the regulations for clearing native vegetation, as non-compliance may result in substantial fines and or rehabilitation. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Button, for that question as well. well. We'll take that on notice as well. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any further public questions? All right, we'll move on to application for a leave of absence. Is there any requests this evening? No. Nope. All right, declarations of interest. We have one this evening uh, from Councillor Tarantroy on item 11.1, um, the Dalyalop Collective donation request. It is a impartiality declaration. Item 7, notice of items to be discussed behind closed doors. We do have one item this evening, 20.1, the nomination for an honorary freeman of the Shire of Capel. We now move to 8.1, the confirmation of the minutes of the ordinary council meeting of the 26th of October. Is there a mover for those minutes? Councillor Andrew. Is there a seconder? Councillor Tarantroy. Does the mover have anything? Seconder. Is there anyone to speak against? No, I'll put those minutes to the vote. Those in favour? And that's carried unanimous. There are no announcements by the presiding person without discussion, so we move to item 10, presentations, deputations and petitions. We have two presentations tonight. Uh, the first from Stephen Aldering, from Aldering and Associates on item 14.9, the proposed extractive industry, hard rock renewal, lots 2644 and 348 Jules Road, Jalorup. Um, thanks very much, Mr. President and, and councillors. Um, I also have with me tonight Jenny Morrow. Uh, Jenny is the Planning and Environment Manager from Wholesome WA, and also Mr. Nick, Nick Lemoyne, who's the Operations Manager for, for Aggregate. Um, 
for the purpose tonight, hopefully I don't need to talk for too long. Uh, happy to answer any questions, of course, but we really wanted to just come and uh, express our support for the of officer's recommendation for approval. Uh, we've had a chance to review the conditions. We didn't get the conditions in advance, so we've been scrambling to have a look at those, and we're comfortable with the conditions as, as they have been presented, uh, with one exception, which is uh, for condition H. And condition H relates to a, a cap on truck numbers. And we have discussed that in further details about what the concerns we have with that. And there is uh, an agreed set of alternate wording, if that's uh, the right term, in terms of an agreed form of wording to express how we would like to present that to council as an alternative. So I'm happy to speak to that, to that later. Um, essentially what the council have in front of them is a proposal that's a renewal of the development that council have previously considered in, in its uh, principal form. It's the same extraction and processing rates that were previously approved by council in 2012, and it's the same extraction footprint that was approved by council in 2012. But there are some important modifications, uh, both in terms of uh, improving the operations of the facility itself, but also some amendments and changes that we think are very beneficial for the residents of Jalora. The key aspects of the proposal is that it's uh, working off a revised 10-year renewal timeframe, uh, which is consistent with the previous approval timeframes. Uh, there are some modifications to introduce a mobile crushing and screening plant. Uh, the reason for that is it improves efficiencies. There is a, a primary crushing plant, but it improves efficiencies in case that breaks down, but it also enables the ability to uh, introduce some crushing for um, recyclable materials. Uh, in contracts, which is just for a small limited amount. Uh, the additional developments have undergone technical studies such as uh, noise and air quality assessments, which have been uh, accepted and de demonstrate that there's no impacts arising from those changes. And I think importantly, um, it doesn't alter anything uh, that the, uh, the, the quarry has been operating historically or as it's been approved in terms of its uh, operating limit of 500,000 tonnes per annum. So. Any changes with those operations still must occur within the, the cap of 500,000 tonnes. A really key positive uh, attribute, uh, we think, for the Jalorup community, is, uh, which comes to the heart of Condition H, um, is that at present truck traffic uh, to the quarry enters and exits the facility from, from Jules Road, which I'm sure most councillors would be aware is a local road that is shared with the, uh, the Jalorup community. Under this new proposal, we're seeking a new internal hall road, uh, which will go to Hastie's Road. Um, so ultimately that will remove all truck traffic from uh, Jules Road. And with the completion of the, the bore, Hastie's Road will be closed to the public from Jules Road, which means that there'll be a dedicated connection for all truck traffic to the bore that will remove uh, all truck traffic from, from Jules Road. So we think that's a significant benefit, and we know that um, despite the fact that the, the quarry's been there for a long time, it just means that the interface with the residential residents of Jalorup will be, will be improved uh, as a consequence. The, the issue we had with Condition H was uh, that it applied a, a fixed cap. Um, our proposal of for, for traffic numbers, I think ha having a regard to the fact that if we're relocating the truck traffic to Hastie's Road, the need for amenity protection is really only focused on Jules Road, and we accept that and we acknowledge, and I think, to be fair, I, I don't believe there's been any complaints about wholesome operations. They do, in my experience, operate as a very good community citizen and um, uh, always try and make sure that they don't cause aggravation and uh, attend to complaints when they, when they receive it. Um, the proposal was never for, for a cap. I can say that most of the traffic is well lower than the cap, but on occasions, if there is going to be slight increases that need to come in there, then there shouldn't be any particular reason why there is a cap uh, imposed. However, what we have done in recognising, I think, a new practice that I think the staff are seeking to introduce for extractive industries, because I know you've had perhaps a couple of recalcitrant operators who might have uh, said there was traffic of a certain volume and, and picked a, a different volume. What we have come up with is a set of wording which does in fact uh, apply a cap um, for uh, Jules Road. So we expect that we will not need to use Jules Road from around 2024, but we can't have full certainty of that timing. But whilst we are using Jules Road for truck traffic, 
At the moment, we don't have any conditions, uh, but we're willing to accept a condition which imposes a cap, which is uh, the number that we council staff have recommended in condition H. We've asked for a 20% uh, a, a redundancy in that figure, so we don't have to keep coming back to the CEO for those sorts of minor, um, very infrequent times when that would need to take, to, take, to take place. But that then does still apply a cap, and it means that if we are aware of a large project that either Holson wants to tender for, or um, uh, or is, has one and wants to operate at a higher level, uh, that we would be, in those larger circumstances, we would be happy to come to the CEO and discuss within the circumstances around that and how we might manage any potential impacts with the community. And, and pretty much that's how things happen today. We, without a condition, uh, there is an attempt to always look after the interests of, of the community. Um, I, have, I can read out the condition, it's on, on my phone, um, but I can either leave that at the end of the presentation, just I'm summing up now really to say that we'd like to commend the officer's recommendation with a modification to condition eight, which, um, uh, and the, uh, really the, um, the proposal represents a continuation of what's been a long-standing extractive industry on that site. It still has a number of years to go. Um, uh, the extraction of basalt in this location has been uh, strongly supported by the Council uh, as recently as 2019 in their submission to the State Government. It is a resource location that is uh, identified under the State's policy as a significant um, resource. As I've mentioned earlier, there's not going to be any increase in throughput, no changes in the hours of operation. Um, so with, with that, um, I'm happy how, how would you like me to do it, Mr. President? Would you like me to read the condition, or would you like me to refer to the to your offices to perhaps read option? What was option two? I'll, ultimately, I'm happy to work with whatever the, the council might want. Unfortunately, our standing orders don't allow um, negotiation sort of through presentations. Um, you're pretty much at the time limit, um, but I'm. If, if there's a specific part you want to include as part of your presentation, yeah, but 30, 30 seconds, because you're pretty much at the limit of your time allocation. Thank you. So if I can perhaps just, just read the, um, uh, the condition, as we'd like to see condition H reworded. In relation to truck movements on Jules Road, numbers are limited to a maximum of 93, brackets 78 plus 20%, close brackets per day, unless otherwise agreed in writing by the Chief Executive Officer. On completion of the internal hall road and crossover to Hastie's Road, no truck movements for transporting the extracted material are permitted on Jules Road. So I think we can see from that that there's a, a long-term intention to try and protect the amenity interests of, uh, uh, for truck traffic being taken off Jules Road. So thank you for your time. Happy to answer any questions. Thank you. All right. Now move on to motions of which previous notion mo notice has been given. Oh, sorry. I have jumped ahead. I was holding it in my hand too. <laughs> now we have a second presentation from uh, Stephen Foster, the board chair of Youth Care WA and David Cunafee, the area chaplain, um, and they're here to present an appreciation to the Shire of Cape. The press it, do you, to talk? Oh dear, it's like being in church. Um, apol apologies for my phone going off earlier. I've got this new watch and the button I press doesn't silence it. it finds your phone and I've discovered that tonight. Um, Dave Cunner from Youth Care School Chaplaincy Services. Uh, we provide chaplains in four schools in the Shire of Capel at Del Yellup College, Del Yellup Primary School, Chuart Forest Primary School and Capel Primary School. Uh, this year is Youth Care's 50th anniversary of operations and as far as I know we have been partnering with the Shire for some 12 years and in July we had a function in Perth and the Shire of Capel were recognised. So just on behalf of myself, our local uh, chairperson from our support group and youth care, I'd just like to present this lovely little glass memento that comes fully with my fingerprints all over it. 
I'd just like to present that to the Shire and thank them for their continuing efforts working with us. All right, now we move on to motions of which previous notice has been given. 11.1, notice of motion funding support request the Dalyallop Collective South West Greener Events Wash Trailer. Councillor Christine Territory has given notice that she intends to move the motion. So moved Councillor Tarantroy. Is there a seconder? Councillor Noonan. Councillor Tarantroy. Um, the Delia Up Collective have um, organised a lot of community events within the Shire of Capel for residents and what they're requesting is a donation to go towards finalising their greener events wash trailer. This is using a lot of recycled materials uh, like washing plates and cups to make, uh, create less waste at events um, and they, have a, they, they want to use the event trailer um, at the Christmas Festival trial this year on the 4th of December. Um, they've sought a lot of funding for it um, and they, they want to do some signage on it, put the logo on it um, of the Shire of Capel and also they have a scheme to rent it out to other localities close who would like to use it for events. So what they're requesting is a donation um, a, a donation to help them um, finalise the trailer ready for a trial at the Day Up Christmas Festival on the 4th of October. Councillor Noonan. Uh, thank you, Mr President, and thank you, Councillor Tarantroy, for moving the motion. I, I think it's a very good idea. Um, I appreciate some concerns that have been raised that the funding is outside the normal um, grants procedure that we would use. However, uh, I think given the benefit that this uh, proposal and the ability to use it on the 4th of December, uh, the Christmas festival would present, you know, if, the, if there's additional work that needs to happen between now and then to get it functional so that it can be used on the 4th. I, I'd be, I, I'm, I believe that the benefit of having it operational and so that it can be used and that it can be uh, then rented out and that sort of thing, rather than having to uh, wait for the normal grants um, procedure which can take months, um, rather than, del than delaying it, I think that it would be good if the Council, if we could find some way of, of supporting this, it's not a huge amount that, that's being asked for, um, and uh, I appreciate that some other organisations might say, well this is setting a, a precedent, however, um, I think it's important to look at the, the cost benefit and um, and certainly the benefits of having it up and functional and um, not just from an environmental point of view, um, but also the fact that it will pay, it, pay back uh, and, and be operational sooner. I think that it's a good idea and I think uh, that we should support this motion. Are there any speakers against the motion? Councillor Clues? Well, I'll just ask the question. Yes. Does the Shire physically have the ability to get an amount of money to a person or entity in two business days? And, and, and not only that, but in time for them to then go and do anything they plan on doing with that money? The Chief Executive Officer. 
um, three years shy, President, there's a, there's a couple of things that need to occur um, before. So the short answer to your question is no. Um, however, I think what the Del Yalop Collective are looking for is an indication of support. So they're hoping to use the trailer for the event in, on the 4th of December. Um, now, if they still need to gain environmental health approval to use the trailer on that event, um, for that event, and there's still some matters to resolve, as far as I understand, in terms of actually using the trailer for the event this weekend. Um, if they are able to gain those approvals, then they would need to use the trailer as is, and then if the Shire supported any funding, then they could use that funding to continue to provide you know, additional work on the trailer. But uh, we would not be in a position to provide them any money in time for this weekend. Are there any speakers for? Speakers against? Councillor Andrew? Thank you. Um, my opposition to this item um, is in no way a reflection of the Day Out Collective and the good work that they do for the Daly Out community or of the project itself. What I have an enormous issue with is providing funds outside of the usual funding cycle and contrary to all usual grant funding applications, allocations and policies pertaining to such funding. I don't think it's transparent or fair to provide funds on an ad hoc basis to community groups violate motions submitted by councillors on behalf of community groups. I consider that it is effectively jumping the queue to access funding through a relationship with a councillor which other community groups may not have the benefit of. Councillors can't gain an advantage through their positions. Our families can't gain an advantage. That's why councillors are required to disclose related parties each year to ensure that people or businesses that have an association with us don't gain preferential treatment. It should also be the case for community groups, sporting associations or volunteer organisations that councillors have an affiliation with. This motion is the absolute epitome of preferential treatment, no matter how worth worthwhile the cause. If the Day Art Collective want to submit a minor community grant scheme application in the normal course of our minor grants funding policies, and the application is assessed within the usual course and officers recommend to provide them with the funds, more than happy to support that officer's recommendation. But don't backdoor your application through a personal contact and expect me to A, support it, or B, not call out the lack of transparency or fairness. The other issue I have is that we very rarely fund complete projects. We fund a percentage. The project of adding the signage is $2,000. The trailer itself appears fully funded. Therefore, as a minor grant request and in line with the minor community grants grant guidelines, the Shire can provide funds of up to one third of the project cost. If my fellow councillors do see fit to provide the funding tonight, because I won't be supporting the motion, I'd at the very least be hoping that they made it contingent on the Day Up Collective securing the required permits and environmental approvals, as noted in the officer's comment, that because if they haven't, then there is no urgency to provide them with this funding, and there's absolutely no excuse for them to not apply in due course, along with all other community groups. The worthwhileness or validity or the little amount of money doesn't negate the precedent that this decision may set. Are there any other speakers? Councillor Clues? Another question, if I may. Yes. Uh, I'll say that this is uh, the motion, anyway, has this pen to come from uh, members of council operating expenditure uh, donations? Yes. Uh, what, what is the correct, or is there a procedure that is generally used for accessing that money? It is at council's discretion. Thank you. So there's no policy in place regarding the use of that money? No, and that can be reviewed as part of the budget preparations for the 2023-24 financial year. Thank you. Can I make an amendment? If I'm finished with my questions, I'll make an amendment and speak now, if that's okay? Yes. 
Uh, I'd like to remove. Uh, so, towards finalising the Southwest Greener Events wash trailer, and then cut from there until the comma after December 2022. So removing in readiness, etc. Let's get up on the board first. Thank you. All right, happy with that, Councillor? Thank you, yes. Is there a seconder for that amendment? Councillor Noonan? Councillor Clues, you have the call. Thank you. Um, if anyone at this table had any interest whatsoever in supporting this item, it should at least be an operable one. Um, with, with that line in the original motion, it, it made this motion absolutely inoperable. If we couldn't get the money to them and the task they intend to complete with that money couldn't be performed in the next two business days, um, then we can't do it. So that line just negates the ability for that that motion at all to be operational, so uh, it, it needed to come out if um, it has any hope of succeeding at all. Thank you. Councillor Noonan? Uh, no, nothing, Dave. Are there any speakers against the amendment? Councillor McCleary? Probably more against the whole motion. I, I tend to agree with uh, Councillor Andrews. It's, it's jumping the um, process that we have in place. S sorry, councillor, just on the amendment. Same thing, yeah, all right, on the amendment. It, yep. Not not to fund the process in here. What do you want to oh, look, I'll leave it and let the amendment, if it doesn't yeah. matter, becomes the motion. Do we still get the talk on the motion? Yes. Yeah, all yeah. Right. Whether the amendment's passed or failed, we will either return or it becomes part of the substantive, so. All right. Are there any other speakers on the amendment? Councillor Clues, do you wish to close on it? I'll put that amendment to the vote. Those in favour? Those against? And that's carried 7-1. That becomes part of the substantive motion. So we return to debate on that. Are there any speakers for or against? Councillor Clues? Do you have a question? Just a question again, yep. please. Sorry, I think I did see it mentioned in the... Um, item, but I, I forget, so if someone can help me, maybe. Um, I think the Shire financially supports the Day Up Collective significantly already. If I could just be reminded what that figure was for, I think it was for the last 12 sure. months or something. So there's, there in, in the budget is an annual allocation for the next three financial years uh, for $20,000 to provide events in the Day Up locality. Thank you. Was that 20000 over three years or 20000 for each year? For each year. Thank you. So $60,000 over three years. That is my understanding. Yep. Thank you. For, yeah, sorry, for four events per year. Yep. Are there any speakers? The Deputy President. Thank you, Mr President. Uh, I wish to move an amendment, which is to add a second point. And I've written it down so that I can <laughs> reread it as many times as we need. But it is um, two, so change that into point one and add point two, which is request the CEO review the eligibility criteria and application process for allocating funds from members of council operating expenditure ACC 0222 donations with the intention to develop a policy. No, I've got it written on here, sorry. <laughs> we'll get it on the board first. Um, amendments can be moved regardless of relevance to the item. 
They can't change the intent. Of can't the change the intent. Councillor. All right, that proposed amendment point, is point on the board. Um, the, we, we can't deal with the point of order at this point. There's, oh, there's, so there's a mover for that amendment. Is there a seconder? Councillor Noonan. The Deputy President. Thank you, Mr President. I think Councillor Noonan might have just been uh, being polite to let this one get on the table for discussion. Look, um, it does not change the intent, and the intent of the motion is tonight to approve the request for financial assistance. That intent's not changed. Um, I just want to, I think a lot of the discussion tonight is around um, fairness, principle, the process that is being followed and how this is able to happen. Um, I remember that this, this fund actually used to be about three times larger than it, than it is now, and council made a decision many years ago to actually take about 20,000 of that and um, put it into a community event fund um, and actually allow the Shire to, um, you know, to, to go through a process or Shire administration to have a process in delivering those funds to community groups. Now, the matter of fact is that there is a operating expenditure account for donations for councillors. Um, I think it's, a, it's an argument of principle, but it's within reason that we are able to do this. Now, if the concern from council is that um, this pro, you know, the, the, the lack of process, therefore, is, is the issue around this item, then very well think that um, item two and actually developing an eligibility criteria for this, and um, that will be up to, like any policy, will be up to council to, to um, endorse at the time. So um, I'm trying to address two things here. Um, I still um, still remains the intent of the motion to obviously endorse the um, recommendation or the motion put forward to us by Councillor Tarantroy. Um, but I'm just trying to do this to try and tie up some loose ends. Councillor Noonan. Uh, thanks, Mr. President, and thanks, Councillor Shano, for bringing this amendment. Um, really. It, it, it is a, it's a good amendment. It's, um, it should really be a motion in its own right, I suppose, that we, we should bring in. And so therefore, uh, if, it, if it fails uh, tonight, I'd like to foreshadow bringing it up as a motion in its own right at the next meeting. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll leave it at that. Uh, because I think it's important that we, that we do have policies so that it, things are clear about how uh, funds are allocated. So thank you, Councillor Luciano and uh, Mr. President. Sure. Just before I continue, Councillor, can I just clarify your foreshadowing a potential motion for the next council meeting? Okay. All right. Are there any speakers against the amendment, Councillor Clues? Thank you. Completely agree with Councillor Noonan. And um, vague relevance is not good enough for attaching uh, an amendment. In my mind, um, it, it is completely irrelevant to the intent of this item. Uh, while it might not be uh, contradictory to the intent, it is not relevant to the intent. Um, so it shouldn't be... We, we, we just can't go tacking on anything that we can find some vague relevance to tack on to anything. Uh, and, and I completely agree, this deserves its own motion. Um, this probably deserves quite a good lengthy conversation. Um, so uh, I, I'm really happy to see it, but it should be up there by itself, not as a amendment. It doesn't suit that. Are there any other speakers on the amendment? Councillor Dillon. 
Thank you, Mr. President. Yes, I'm of a like mind to uh, Councillor Noonan and Councillor Clues. I don't doubt the sincerity of the Deputy President's putting this amendment forward, but I'd like to see it tackled in and on itself some other time, and I'd probably agree with the foreshadowing. Thank you. Are there any other speakers on the amendment? I want to say a few words. Um, I agree a lot with the intent of the amendment, um, but whichever way this motion goes, I, can, I, I think there's a general consensus around the table from what I'm hearing that there is an appetite to have that account reviewed and have some terms of reference established around it. Um, we don't need a council decision to do that. We can just do that as part of the budget preparations for next year. So I think based on the intent of council I'm getting right now, we can probably just do that um, as we go into building the next budget and establish the terms of reference. So just for that reason, I, don't, I probably won't actually support this. Um, even though I, I, I do agree with it, I just think we'll deal with that as a separate issue as part of the budget preparations for 23-24. Uh, if there's no other speakers, the Deputy President to close. Just to say briefly that it says on the second line, fines rather than funds. <laughs> but I don't wish to add anything else to discussion. No, it's changed the amendment. All right, we'll <laughs> All right, I'll put that amendment to the vote. Those in favour and those against. And that amendment is lost 7-1. So we return to the substantive motion. Uh, are there any other speakers for or against? Councillor McCleary. As I was going to indicate before, I tend to agree with uh, Councillor Andrews. This is um, circumventing a process that we have in place. I, I'm going to vote against this um, motion point of order. Uh, for a number of reasons that they... So point of order, Councillor Clues. Thank you. I think um, accusations of circumventing processes uh, inappropriate and we've already discussed that that isn't the case here. Um, I sort of think that's more of an opinion in terms of that's a councillor's feeling towards using this this fund and it's probably not a valid point of order. If I'd made the motion I'd not want to be being accused of circumventing a process. Sure. All right. Well, going forward, we'll, we'll, I'll ask councillors to refrain from using such terms then. Um, and I take your point. Councillor McCleary. Point of order. Councillor Clues. We had a discussion some months ago about the correct process on that exact point of order. I've, I've dealt with the point of order, councillor. <coughs> councillor McCleary. Thank you, Mr. President. Yeah, look, I'll retract that statement. Uh, look, I'm going to vote against this because I think there's opportunity within the uh, process of, of funding these organisations, there's a, an option where they could go through the, through the process of um, where we call for um, funding of, of um, community groups. Uh, I also have a bit of concern that it's not quite ready. I'm not sure that that was dealt with in the, in the amendment. Um, Whilst I agree it's a nice idea, it probably fits into our waste disposal process and, and that's, but I think there's a bit more work to be done. And I see there's a, an opportunity when the next community grants are out that this group can um, place something in that. Are there any other speakers for or against the motion? Councillor Dillon. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Yeah, look, I um, commend uh, Councillor Terentroy on uh, bringing this to our attention, but I think it's probably uh, the wrong way to go about it. I do concur with my fellow councillors in that it should probably go through the official process and... Uh, point of order. Councillor Clues, a point of order. Once again, we're hearing accusations of going the wrong way about things or incorrect processes. Councillor, that's, that, that's an opinion and you're not raising a valid point of order. Someone is being accused, someone at this table is being accused of lodging a motion that's been against some process. We've found that to not be the case whatsoever. That accusation is false and it's unfair. Yes, but a councillor is stating their opinion that they don't think it is the appropriate process. It is an opinion. Are we allowed to think and express our thoughts accusing 
fellow council members of poor behaviours. There is an appropriate place to do that, but councillors have expressed their opinion that they don't think this is an appropriate mechanism. That has been my interpretation. Councillor Dillon, you have the call. Thank you, Mr. President. Yeah, absolutely no aspersions cast on my fellow councillor across the way. Uh, she's a committed and uh, dedicated councillor, so absolutely no aspersions cast there. Uh, I just would like to see this motion presented to uh, council uh, through other mechanisms, shall we say, Councillor Clues. Thank you. All right. Uh, there being no other members eligible to speak, um, I will say a few words. Um, look, I, I do agree entirely with the project and I think what the Daliop Collective has put forward is a great initiative, um, but I too agree that there we do have a community funding stream where this is probably more appropriate to have gone. Um, I, I do want to see us review our elected members' donations fund as part of our next budget going forward and establishing some terms of reference. Um, in my history on the council, I have only recall it ever being used very rarely. In fact, there is only one I can actually recall, and that was for a donation to the Lord Mayor's Disaster Relief Appeal in relation to the Perth Hills bushfires. Um, but it also reminds me of a time prior to 2018, we had no council policy or direction around events funding, so we had established our community grants funding, but we didn't have a set process for events funding and that resulted in a bit of an ad hoc process in which some people who were having earlier festivals in the financial year were getting in early, getting their money in, because that's when they were wanting to do it, and then that fund being totally depleted, and those who were sort of getting towards the end of the financial year for their first festival were unfortunately missing out. So we put in place a policy, put in place a rigorous, uh, accountable, and, um, and uh, a, a way of testing uh, these community requests. So that's the path I want to go down. In fact, this is probably something that could even go down a different path in terms of a actual budget request because I would actually rather, instead of seeing the Shire, just put a little bit of money towards it. I think this is one of those initiatives like how we provide paper to our local desktop print printers. This is something where we could probably even provide perhaps the soap or cleaning utensils and be part of an ongoing initiative going forward. But that's, that's for another consideration. So great initiative. Um, I look forward to hopefully seeing it there on the 4th, um, down at the Christmas Festival, but um, I can't support this this evening. All right. Uh, there being no other further eligible speakers, is it a question, Councillor Clues? Uh, I've got you down here as having spoken and moved an amendment. Okay. Um, yeah, I, I might have misinterpreted, um, but just to be safe, uh, we'll suspend standing order 10.1 just to allow you to discuss, and then we'll, then we'll put it back in, just because I don't want to breach protocol. So I'll move that we suspend standing order 10.1. Is there a seconder? Councillor Andrew. I'll put that to the vote. All those in favour, that's carried unanimous. Councillor Clues. My apologies. I think when I moved the amendment, I did say at the time that I would also speak to the item, but then I failed to do so. so that's my fault. Sorry. Um, yeah, I, I actually will be supporting the item. Um, I, I would prefer to see this have come through the um, some channels we have in place that are already here for this purpose. Um, but at the same time, I, I also remember only a few years ago we had a community member. Um, that uh, wished for some support. Uh, I don't think it was even financially. I think it was just some time um, to do with some Christmas um, street closures or something. Um, that, for the same reasons that are being mentioned here tonight, uh, was refused. Uh, and um, I, I remember thinking, geez, it, you know, it would have been nice if we could have um, helped that person out. So um, I, I'm I'm really happy to see that in the staff. Uh, comments or the officers comments that there's not actually a definitive uh, support or not support for this item and that it has been left to council. Um, I'm glad that some other means has been found so that the request is not through a policy that does dismiss its uh, its uh, correctness 
Um, there's absolutely nothing wrong. There's no procedure or nor policy being breached. This is, um, for all intensive purposes, this is the purpose of that fund that, quite frankly, I didn't even know existed um, until we looked at this item. So it is what it is. Um, and like everyone that's brought it up has mentioned, the work of the Day Up Collective is um, incredible. Uh, they do amazing things for the community, uh, and I'd be more than happy to um, to access a fund that is there for exactly this purpose, uh, to help them get something else over the line that's going to give back to the community. Um, I, I, there, there is no reason, no written policy, no regulation against this whatsoever. Um, I, I think this is awesome. Good on them, and um, yeah. Doesn't sound like we're going to have much luck, but uh, I wish them all the best. Is there anyone else wishing to speak while we are in suspending standing orders? Councillor Noonan. Thank you, Mr. President. Just to um, perhaps ask a question, if I may, through the chair of the um, director of finances, um, the the ten thousand dollars that we have allocated in the members of council budget and we have $9,800 available. So we've only spent $200 of that $10,000. Um, over the previous, say, two or three, four or five years, how often have we not spent a significant proportion of that fund? Uh, thank you for your question, Councillor Noonan, through the Shah President. Um, just reflecting on the Shah President's comments in terms of the last time he could remember when this fund was used to support such events, would be going back to the disaster relief funding that the Council at that time approved for the bushfires in the Perth Hills. Um, since I've been in this position, I haven't, um, I haven't seen any um, allocation from that account through this process since I commenced at the Shire. Second question, if I may. Um, yeah, <laughs> no, thanks. Um, yeah, no, actually not. Okay, thank you. Are there any other speakers? The Deputy President. Thank you, Mr President. It just raises another question for me um, on page 14 uh, in the officer's comment. It says, members of council donation, budget 10,000, available 9,800. So would that imply that there was a $200 expended from that account? The director of community and corporate. It would imply those, those $200 obviously during this financial year, but to ask to let you know what that is, I couldn't tell you, I'd have to take that on notice and let you know. Are there any other speakers? Uh, I'll Sorry, move. Maybe final question, if I could, from the yep. chair, President. Um, if that money uh, isn't spent, that ten thousand dollars isn't spent, it, it just gets absorbed back into the allocation through the chair. The allocation will remain until the end of this financial year and through the draft annual budget process when council have an opportunity to review the individual line items of expenditure if there's an appetite there for council to review either increase or reduce the amount that's the decision of council if there's no further comments i'll move that we reinstate standing order 10.1 is there a seconder councillor clues all those in favour? It's carried unanimous. All right, having every speaker been eligible to speak, Councillor Tarantroy, do you wish to close debate? Yes, please. Um, the main reason for the, the trailer is to reduce the rubbish going to landfill. This is an issue in our shire. It's an issue in every council within Australia. Um, because of contamination of rubbish bins. Um, the Daylight Collective has um, 
last year they had bin ferries to try and help people but people were still contaminating and the main contamination was from fast food packaging from the food uh, vendors at the event who were selling food to the, um, to the residents and families that came to these free events. So um, this was the whole reason behind the, the trailer and I mean they received $2,000 a grant to purchase the trailer from Dale Up Beach Estate. They received a thousand dollar grant from Southern Ports to buy some equipment to put inside the trailer. They um, got a thousand dollars from Clean Heat Community Grants to purchase the secondhand crockery. Notice it was secondhand, so pre-loved, and um, cutlery from local op shops. So it was a very frugal um, construction and put together of this trailer. And then they also um, they also applied for a two thousand seven hundred dollar uh, community grant from the um, Bank of Cape, uh, the Community Bank of Capel, to register and ensure the, the trailer and to buy a marquee tables and a first aid kit and to pay for a videographer for the first event. So we wanted to prom use the, the uh, Christmas festival to promote the event, uh, to pro promote the trailer and the eco-friendly steps that this volunteer communi uh, community organisation that's run on volunteers. Uh, I have no financial interest in this. I'm a volunteer for the community collective. Yes, I disclosed um, that I was, um, I did, um, I disclosed that I am a founding member of the Dale Up Collective, but I'm, I've been, a, I'm a member of a lot of community organisations and I volunteer for. Um, so the, the reasoning behind me supporting this was because I received a very um, transparent email from the chair of the Daily Up Collective, I didn't even know that they were going to ask for this um, this two thousand dollar amount of money, and I thought, well, hell, you know, they do a really good job. They were run on volunteer power, and we're actually helping the Shire reduce contamination and landfill. Um, so I, I thought this was a win-win, and I thought two thousand dollars just so they can, um, you know, if they spend money from another area and then they get this to backfill it will be ready for the fourth to use but what they can do then they can juggle the money if they know they're getting this two thousand dollars and actually have it ready for the for the event um yeah so it wasn't about getting the money in two days it was about being able to shift money around knowing we were getting the two thousand dollars and i say we because i'm a community community person and that's how i operate um, I'm a part of the community. I'm not trying to do a shifty here. I'm trying to re reward a community group that has done so much for our community, for the whole of the Capel Shire, because not only Dale Up people go to the community festival um, and the other, for the other events that they run. And just touching on the $20,000 recurring grant in three years, that $20,000 is on the proviso that the Dale Up Collective provide four events a year. Now, if you know anything about event coordination or running an event, it's huge. And these are volunteers doing this. It's not anyone getting paid to do this. Um, so, yeah. Um, so, I urge my council, uh, fellow councillors to consider my final words and to see the benefit of this for our whole community and also for the um, wider community too. People from Bunbury come. People from, um, from Donnybrook come. People from, um, even people from Bustleton come to the Dale Up um, Collective Christmas Festival because it is such a wonderful event with lots of, everything's free. You can make a gold coin donation if you wish, but you don't have to. It's one of those things that builds a community at a time of year where we're meant to be pulling together and helping and showing kindness to our fellow man. Thank you. All right, I'll put that to the vote. Those in favour? And those against? And that is 4-4. Four, four. Um, sure, would, that, would that require... All right. All right, the casting vote is in the negative, so the motion is lost. Five, four. All right.
Item 12, questions of which previous notice has been given. There are none. So we now move to the Chief Executive Officer reports. 13.1, CEO KPIs and 2022-23 performance agreement. Is there a mover? Councillor Clues, a seconder? I'd like to move it with amendments. Oh, it's already on the board. Sure, sure. I see Councillor Clues is moving an alternative recommendation as on the board. Is there a seconder to that amendment? Councillor Noonan. Councillor Clues. Thank you, yes. The um, small change I've made is really quite minor in uh, detail, but um, to me, uh, very, very important in the grand scheme of things. All I've uh, asked is that the specific KPIs relating to staff safety um, be placed at the top of uh, the scoreboard, I guess we'd call that box. I'm not sure what we want to refer to it as. Uh, the table. <laughs> Um, yeah, it, it's it's good practice, um, best practice amongst the rest of the uh, the working world, I guess. That um, when it comes to KPIs in any business group, that um, the safety of our people should be our absolute number one priority, uh, and I'd, I'd like to see that flow into the shire. Um, uh, I know where I work, it starts right at the very top of that business, and it flows down through every single person working under KPIs, it transfers to the very first of everyone's KPIs. Um, so uh, I just want to get us in, in line with that practice and um, make sure that we're people focused. Uh, other than that, I guess on the on the item as a whole, um, I, I've got to say I'm, I'm uh, overwhelmed with the great response we've had to our feedback to this document uh, from when we initially received it. The, the movement towards uh, making smart goals for me is um, uh, absolutely fantastic and I, I can't thank um, our CEO, Mr McMile, enough for, um, for his support in, um, in going in that direction. I think that'll be a really good thing for us and, and, and for the Shire, so, um, so uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you, Gordon. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Noonan. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Yes, just to uh, echo Councillor Clue's sentiments that um, that the document is very good. I think the K KPIs uh, that we have in front of us now are very clear. Um, I think they're achievable, and uh, I think that they're also ambitious. And um, uh, I think that um, it, I think that that makes the the, the challenge of trying to address and, and achieve those KPIs that um, that much more achievable. Um, so I think that that's good. It's incumbent on us to make it clear, and I think that this this motion does do that. So uh, not just for the current CEO, but for future CEOs, I think it's good, a good motion. Thank you, Councillor Lynn. Are there any speakers against the motion? Speakers for Councillor McCleary. Thank you, Mr. President. This is um, I'm quite impressed, and I did miss out on the probably sitting in on some of the KPI things, and and I think there's a, a good list in there, which fellow councillors have come work in workshops to get to that outcome. And one of the good things about this, it's it's actually a public document. It's it's there for the community to to look at. It. That's my understanding of. Where this is, and hence we're talking about it in a public forum. So that's a fairly open and accountable process that's been um, introduced in this um, regime. So I'm, I'm quite happy with that. There's, there's a whole lot of things that relate from the various reports and that feed into this uh, KPI scenario. So um, yeah, I commend that um, these KPIs be endorsed. Are there any other speakers for or against? Councillor Tarantroy. I'd like to commend the CEO for the work that he's put into reviewing this. Uh, we worked ex uh, exclusive, uh, like the 
the um, council worked with him and talked with him about it, and he was very willing to go back to the drawing board and change things around. I believe that this is a positive thing uh, for transparency reasons, but also because it shows a um, council that is supporting the CEO, and it's really, really good to be a part of a council and a staff led by a CEO and his two other leadership um, members, leadership team members, um, working together so well for the benefit of the Shire. Thank you. Are there any other speakers on the item? Councillor Clues, do you wish to close? I'll put the item to the vote. Those in favour? And that's carried unanimous. We now move to item 13.2, the review of retail trading hours, proposed community consultation. Is there a mover? The Deputy President, Councillor Schiano. Is there a seconder? Councillor Andrew. The Deputy President. Uh, thank you, Mr President. I'm going to refrain from talking about some of the different outcomes that you can get um, in regards to retail trading. I mean, I've actually learnt quite a bit from the report itself around particularly the, the way that small businesses are able to to already manage their own deregulated trading hours. But I, simply what we're being asked here to do is undertake a cons consultative process, right? So um, I think retail hours, um, gone are the days when I was a kid in Gatanning where Woolies closed at 12 o'clock on a Saturday. The world of commerce is, is greatly changing. Um, and so whatever the outcome of this process is, the process does need to occur because we do need to have a conversation about what the future of commerce looks like in the Shire and particularly um, how that relates to um, our neighbouring shires as well. And it will have a huge flow on effect to, um, to business and the way that we attract business to the shire potentially, however which way the process decides to go. But um, I'm glad for that conversation to be happening. Um, and so I um, obviously support the officer's recommendation. Councillor Andrew. Thank you. Um, I couldn't support this more um, either. Um, I personally believe that all levels of government should have little influence or impact or control in business enterprise. Um, I believe wholeheartedly that business owners should be able to run their businesses in a market economy driven by market conditions and consumers. And I think all levels of government should have, little, as, should have as little influence over businesses as possible. Thank you, Councillor. Any speakers against the question, Councillor Clues? Thank you. Um, I'm just curious through the Chair if, if someone could let me know if this was... Um, uh, has this been brought to us having received some feedback on on the situation that is currently in place? Or is, is this something that um, Shire officers have, have felt we're in need of or due for? The Chief Executive Officer. Um, through you, Shire President, the, um, I guess the awareness of the existing arrangements um, for the retail trading hours at the Shire of Capel did come out of a, a, a conversation with a, with a prospective business. Um, it, was, it was really superficial at that time, but what it led to was for us to do further um, further research in terms of the retail trading circumstances in our neighbouring local governments and how they came to be what they were um, and what ours were and, and what the differences were. So, and then also learn what the process would be if, if, uh, if council wanted to have a conversation with the business and the community about whether or not they should change to be more reflective of our neighbours. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, I, I, I agree uh, very much with Councillor Andrew um, in the amount of interference that uh, uh, a government at any level should have in uh, the operations of, uh, of our local businesses. I, I guess, um, and, and also I must say I, the, um, the report and the, the, the way that it's lined out that this review will, will take place um, with the level of inclusivity of our local business owners um, is great as well. It was really, really good to see. Um, I, in fact, it, the detail involved and the, and the planning that looks like it's to take place and, and, and occur is, um, is all fantastic. 
and I'm really happy to see it. My, my only concern would be that if the community broadly doesn't want any changes and we sink a whole heap of time and resource into it. So um, I, I guess um, I, I would support the item, but I, I would just ask that um, I guess in the course of completing this review, if, if there is some findings that broadly the, the Shire is just not in any, uh, doesn't have any desire at all to make any changes that we, we recognise that we don't sink too much into it and, and perhaps look at coming back early with a, with a briefer review. But um, I'm sure that would be at the staff's discretion and they'll be able to handle that just fine. Thank you, Councillor. Are there any other speakers for or against? Councillor McCleary. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, look, I'm, I'm for this motion uh, simply because it's going out and giving some community consultation about trading hours. And one of the key things in the item is the review of the neighbouring shires and what their trading hours are like. We're, we're out of kilter with that. Um, and I think, depending on the outcome of the review, it'd be nice to think that we, we could get an adjustment and it, it attracts new businesses into the Shire, and that's where we're trying to look at, like grow, grow our, um, our local businesses. Um, there's probably opportunities for businesses that have been held back by the trading hours that might be able to grow as well, maybe employ a few more staff. So it, it, there's a lot of opportunities there. So hopefully we get um, some good community input, some good business input. Um, I need to be weighed up about everything, but uh, yeah, I'll go on for this um, process. Are there any other speakers? Councillor Taran Troy. Um, I'm for this review too because it's an opportunity to, get, um, to have a balanced approach to the regulation of the trading hours within the Shire of Capel. And it's also got the capacity to create an environment that supports existing businesses and also encourage new businesses and development and expansion and anything like that that um, helps um, our ratepayers and our businesses um, to create more wealth for our shire and more services that the community needs is great, especially with community consultation and that's the whole point of the review. I'll be voting for this. Thank you. Are there any other speakers? No. Uh, the Deputy President, you wish to close? No, nothing further to address from the, the points that have been made by fellow councillors. I'll put that to the vote. Those in favour? And that's carried unanimous. We now move to item 13.3, the reviewed communications and social media policy. Um, this item was deferred from the October meeting. Uh, it was moved by Councillor Schiano and seconded by Councillor Tarantroy. Uh, it was deferred immediately. There had been no discussion. So the Deputy President, do you wish to speak? I will just note it was deferred once um, the mover and seconder had already spoken because I attempted to defer it and was told I couldn't as the mover, so I'm pretty sure the mover and the seconder have spoken. Sorry, my mistake. Um, are there any speakers for or against policy? Councillor Clues? Question, if I may. Who, who was yes. the mover and seconder? I wasn't here. The mover was... Councillor Schiano and the seconder was Councillor Terran Troy. Are there any speakers for or against? Councillor Andrew. Thank you. Um, I like this policy a lot more than I did last month, um, which I thought breached several areas of our free speech, political communications and section 109 of our constitution. But I still think where councillors are concerned it's unnecess it unnecessarily repeats what's already contained in legislation. Um, and I'd be even happier and I'd be supporting the item if it had no mention of councillors' communication at all and was purely a policy for staff ran communication channels. Phrases like consistent messaging not only scares the crap out of me, but it also it's also not going to always be consistent with openness and honesty. I believe completely that across shire ran communication channels, of course the has, messaging has to be consistent, 
but to have that phrase incorporated into a policy that applies to councillors as well doesn't have my support. Councillors are already legislatively bound to support decisions of council and that should have to be the full extent of any consistent messaging between councillors or from councillors to the public. Point 109 applies to councillors' private communications. I don't think there's an adult on social media that wouldn't be aware that anything that gets put into the stratosphere can be dragged back to bite you in the backside one day. But if something I write gets dragged up and bites me in the backside, it's not for the CEO, it's not for, count for fellow councillors, and it's not for this policy to chastise and punish me. It's up to the community come election time to decide if I'm the person with a character that they want to see representing them as a councillor. Uh, so while I'm happier than what I was when this policy came out in last month's agenda, um, I still can't support it. Sure. Sorry, I'll just clarify a few things for the meeting. The policy that's included in the uh, agenda is the one that was deferred. An alternative officer's recommendation has been provided and has been circulated around the table based on the workshop that councillor had uh, that council had, uh, which remo removed a lot of concern points. So someone will need to uh, foreshadow that if council wishes to go down that line. Councillor Clues. Thank you. Um, not having been here for the last month and just seeing this now, can I ask to move a brief adjournment, please? Even just five minutes so I can catch up on what's actually this is about and what's going on. Uh, sure, all right. I'll adjourn the meeting for five minutes and we'll reconvene at 7.33 p.m.
Okay, all right. I'll reconvene the meeting and we take off from we work. Councillor Clues, you have the call. Thank you. Yes, I'd like to move an alternate motion, the uh, printed copy we were given just prior to the meeting. So, sure. Uh, it's moved. So you'll have to foreshadow that one, Councillor, as we have to deal with the item on the table. Sorry, for um, foreshadow. Yeah, so Councillor Clues has foreshadowed the Alternatives Officer's recommendation to item 13.3. Okay, so we still continue where we are. Um, Councillor Clues, you still have the call on the current item. Thank you. Uh, yeah, so the, the uh, similar to the, um, we were just discussing the KPIs, the, the, there's a night and day difference uh, between what's in the agenda and what we've been handed, um, particularly when it comes to some of the concerns around the table that um, I have heard and, uh, and, and I agree with. The, um, so I, I, I think we're best placed to, uh, to vote no on this one uh, and move on to the uh, foreshadowed, not the alternate. Um, which I think is a, a much, a much better written document that um, should, should please everyone. I think. Are there any other speakers for or against the item? Uh, no, as the move, Councillor Skiana, do you wish to close on the item? Uh, I can I can read the writing on the wall. There's obviously a better alternative that's been presented and foreshadowed, which is been come through with a number of conversations and briefings and workshops so I don't think I need to add anything further to the item that's been discussed at the moment. All right I'll put that to the vote those in favour and those against and that item is lost unanimous. Oh sorry I saw that all right I'll take that vote again because Said that wrong. All right. So those in favour of the item, and those against, and that item is lost. One seven. We now move to the foreshadowed alternative officers recommendation moved by Councillor Clues. Is there a seconder to that item, Councillor Tarantroy? Councillor Clues. I can't move an amendment because I moved it as it's written. Someone might be able to do that for me and I'll uh, reserve my uh, comments for later. Councillor Tarantroy. Um, yes, I'd like to move in it. As a seconder, I can move an amendment. Yes. Yes. Um, so under 1.6 um, in the, for shadow, the motion on the table, um, second paragraph down, it says, councillors are also encouraged to actively share Shire-driven communications, information and updates through appropriate channels via attendance at community events to ensure consistency in messaging to the community. Um, I would like to get rid of to ensure consistency in messaging in the community. One point six second paragraph down. Okay, so Councillor Tarantroy moving a motion to omit certain words. Um, we'll get that up on the board and then we'll So that's the phrase that's that particular paragraph that up on the board now with the words that Councillor Tarantroy is. Yes, because omitting. Oh, can I can I speak to it too why not yet. Oh not yet, okay. Is that on the board, councillor, as you are describing? Yes. Yep. All right. Is there a seconder to that amendment? Councillor Clues, Councillor Tarantroy. 
The reason I um, have done this is because um, in support of my fellow councillor, um, Andrew, and, um, yep. Yeah. Yes. Sorry, councillor Tarrant Roy, you have to call. Um, is because it, it um, as councillors, we still, uh, we, we, we do support shy driven communications and information, but we shouldn't be restricted and, and to ensure consistency in messaging it to the community because um, we all we are all different councillors and we're all sitting around a table and we all bring something different to the table. And I think you, we can support things and in, um, ac actively share things if we want to. I don't really think those words to ensure consistency in messaging to the community because it seems like it's it's um, a pre-play or a prelude to what has um, been. <laughs> Basically, it feels like it's restricting us. It, f it doesn't feel transparent and clear for the original reasons. Um, Councillor Andrews mentioned not uh, not, um, not liking the, that wording either. So that's why I quickly read read it and got rid of it. Thank you, Councillor Clues. Thank you. Am I able to, with the permission of the mover, uh, change the wording of the amendment? If the mover consents. Thank you. Um, I'm, con I'm wondering if we wouldn't be better saying something along the lines of removing, um, removing from the document mentions of council's directions or council law's directions. I agree. Thank you. Sorry, I'm just not clear on the amendment and the effect of that. So the effect is that the policy will become that of the Shire, and it will not be, be uh, will not necessarily be directing of councillors' actions, behaviours, communications in any way whatsoever. Probably substantially changing the amendment in which Councillor Tarrant Troy has moved. Mm. Um, so I don't think we could include it in that I, part. I think it's just an extension of what she's already moved. I think the, the uh, particularly as she's commented to it, and, and I'm asking that if with her permission that we change what she's moved as an amendment anyway. Yeah, I will. Well, can I just can we just find out actually how that's written first? So we just see it, and then I'll get the set the, the mover to consent to it first. Uh, sorry, point of order, uh, if that's possible at this stage. Uh, yes, point of order, Councillor Noonan. Is it possible to move uh, to defer this item again? Because I think it sounds that's like we probably have probably a, a question, Councillor, not a point of order. Yeah, um, yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. once <laughs> once this is dealt with, you can ask the question. Okay. Right. Point of order, Councillor Schiano. Point of order, standing orders 9.9, sub clause 2, an amendment must be relevant to the primary motion to which it is moved and must not have the effect of neg negating the primary motion. Well, the, the motion hasn't formally been moved or seconded yet. The seconder is requesting a change by the mover. So. We'll just get it on the board and see what the mover wishes to consent. Does the mover consent to that addition to the amendment? That's about as far as you go. So the mover, do you consent to those changes? Um, I, I think it changes the intent and I was just in support of um, Councillor Andrew's stance on the um, consistency in messaging because that's not what we want. Oh, the all right. So, so no. So no. no. Yeah. All right. 
So we'll just go back to the original amendment moved by Councillor Tarantroy. So, Councillor Clues, you as the seconder, do you wish to speak to the amendment? Are there any speakers against the amendment? Councillor Noonan. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Can I move that the motion be deferred until the next um, next meeting of council, ordinary meeting of council, in order to give us time to work out some of those finer details? I know th this alternative motion is certainly a lot closer to what councillors, I think, would be comfortable with. I think it's uh, allayed a lot of the concerns that it might impinge on freedom of speech. Um, it it um, encourages councillors and employees to promote shire projects and initiatives. And I think that that's a, a good thing, but, but I think that it would be better to have those discussions um, and and to try and, um, you know, clean or, or sort this out so that everybody can uh, can be happy with supporting it. Although that that actually sounds like <laughs> the brave new world in in itself. But I, I'd prefer it if we could maybe. Um, all right. So workshop this for a little bit more first. Sorry. All right. So. Councillor Noonan has moved a procedural motion. Is there a second for it? Councillor Clues. Councillor Noonan. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. I think it'd be good to be just to have a little bit more time. Uh, there's there's no great urgency. There's um, no particular issue on the on the table that that um, that needs to that requires this motion to go through straight away. So I think it'd be good for us to have a little bit more time to think about it. Um, so I'd, I'd urge or you know, encourage councillors to consider that deferral. All right, I'll put that to the vote. Those in favour? And those against? 4-4. I'll through the casting vote in favour, so the item is deferred until December 2022 Ordinary Council meeting to allow further time to consider. Question through the Chair? Uh, oh. Not at this point, oh. Councillor. Okay, we move to item 13.4, Policy Review, Council Travel Expenses. Is there a mover? Councillor Andrew? Councillor Andrew moving with an amendment. So I'll just hold there though, just let the minute taker to catch up. Councillor Andrew, your amendment? So it's removing um, point three regarding the fuel card for the president and then obviously then renumbering from four down. All right, is there a seconder to that amendment? Councillor McCleary. Councillor Andrew. Thank you. Uh, most of this is just a clean up of the existing policy and narrowing what travel councillors, um, what is reimbursable for councillors, um, except point three was adding something new. Um, further investigation since the agenda was released has determined that the intention by the drafter was that the policy was intended for the fuel card to work um, just like that of a fleet car fuel card. Um, the problem I feel with that is that all fuel um, is chargeable with a fleet car and all the kilometres are logged through the odometer reading that's then entered at the fuel station every time you use the card. 
So I'm just a bit perplexed about how that was going to work for a, a vehicle that's used for private use and councillor use, um, and then how the card and the charges um, become auditable. So um, I've made the amendment to remove it. Um, that's it. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor McCleary. Thank you, Mr. President. Yeah, look, I agree with Councillor Andrews on this one, and I think there's adequate in the policy way removing that for um, travel claims in general. So, um, and there's an audible process with those things. So, yes, um, I support the amendment. Are there any speakers against the amendment? Speakers for? Oh, sorry, Councillor Scano. Just firstly to clarify, we're not speaking to an amendment, we're speaking to an oh, yes. um, alternative yep. motion that was moved, that's correct? Yep. Yes. Yep. Yep. So speaking to the um, motion which is on the table, um, look, I'm very supportive of the fact and nature that this um, policy has been reviewed and it's been tightened, um, but I am of the stance that travel, um, apart from potentially for the Shire President, whose role requires substantial um, more work in, in representing the Shire, um, and particularly outside of the Shire's boundaries. Um, it does not sit well with me at all that a councillor can um, can claim travel inside the Shire. I mean, we get a remit, we get a what well, we sometimes is referred to as a meeting fee, sometimes is referred to as an income. I, I think the correct terminology is actually really meeting fee, which would argue that maybe we only get paid to be here in the room for the meetings, but. I mean, this is a community service and the Shire is not a large, it's not a large Shire. I mean, I have been on council for seven years and I've claimed travel twice. Once was to, ma to mandatory training in Perth and the second was to local government convention and that cost was actually approved by council before I went. And that in seven years, I think it's probably equivalent to about $600 worth of travel. Um, I think it could be tighter. I mean, I'm happy that this has been done. I think this is a step in the right direction. I haven't quite really made up my mind yet on whether or not out of that principle that it has, it is an improvement that I'll support the policy, but I, it just it just doesn't sit well with me that, you know, we continue, we can, we can rack up bills um, on travel. And um, I, I definitely for sure would never do it um, unless absolutely needed to or was well and truly put out of my way. Um, I've been to Perth um, for council related activities many times in the last seven years. And like I said, I've only ever claimed twice. So um, not quite sitting well with me at the moment. I'm gonna let the, um, I'll listen to debate and make a decision when the time requires me to do so. Are there any other speakers for or against? Councillor Clues. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I, I agree very much with uh, Councillor Schiano. I think the, I'm, Disappointed to see the number of things in here that are claimable. I had no idea. Um, I, I think the um, the meeting fee, as it was uh, as it was called, is um, far far more than any cost I incur by attending meetings. Um, the, there's there's no requirement to attend a lot of the things that a lot of us attend. We choose to do so. We choose to do so in our role as volunteers. Um, I, I'm not sure why that warrants some kind of um, uh, cost reimbursement above what we're already reimbursed for being here. Um, it doesn't make any sense to me that we can we can be reimbursed travel to go to meetings. According to this, uh, you're kidding me. Oh, we, that's part of the deal. That's what we're already being paid for. Uh, well refunded for I guess as it's as it is not not paid as an employee but um, uh, yeah so I'm I'm, I'm going to be voting against this item because I, I, I think I, I've never used any of this I don't see any reason why anyone should be using any of this um, so um, yeah that's that's me on it are there any other speakers councillor Andrew a question it is a question yep um is there a way to tighten this up? I agree wholeheartedly with Councillor Schiano and Clues. Is there a way to tighten this up and not be in breach of our legislation that um, covers our travel allowances? Sure. 
I'd have to take that on advisement um, as the Act specifically states that travel allowance and reimbursement must be provided by the local government and can be claimed by the, on the local government. Um, Council does have some flexibility into, into which what it allows. Um, but the Chief Executive Officer, do you have any additional in terms of what's been included is above and beyond the Act? So sorry, just before sure. the CEO does, I guess my specific um, request or amendment, although I couldn't move it, would be limiting reimbursement of expenses that was travel outside the Shire. So is that within our perusal to be able to do that? Sorry, sorry. As, in, as in you could only claim outside of the local government? Yes. Yep. I, I, I don't believe so, because as the, as the Act does provide that Council, a councillor is able to claim reimbursement from travel from their primary residence or place of work to the chamber. Okay, thanks. Sure. Uh, Ken. Thank you. Yeah, I'll move a procedural motion, please, that we defer to the next OCM. Yes, yes, thank you. Yes. All right, is there a second for that procedural motion? Councillor Noonan, Councillor Clues. Thank you. I, I would like to give this every chance of um, getting through and I, I would rather see a cleaned up motion get through rather than have something fall over. So um, uh, as it stands for, for me, it would be falling over. So um, I think it's best we probably have a closer look and um, double check some of the details and, and see what our options are and um, have another crack next month. I'll put that to the vote. Those in favour of the deferment and those against and that's lost 6-2. Um, so we now return to the substantive item. Are there any further speakers for or against? Councillor Tarantroy. Um, I'm for the motion as it stands. The, I think we need to be very careful when we start uh, removing allowances. Uh, councillors are elected members. We are not volunteers. We are not staff. Now, if we start um, wanting to play around and take stuff out of what is in the Local Government Act, an allowance is there to allow equity and to allow people who don't work full time to be able to um, put their hand up to stand for council. And if we don't have those allowances, what we are if in effect doing, only allowing people with money to be sitting on council. And that's not a position that we need on council. We need people from all walks of life to be able to feel that they can contribute and afford to contribute and claim um, travel allowance if that's what they need to do to be able to serve. Point of order. How is uh, the point of order, councillor. Um, I've, I've made it clear already that I've not made a claim. Is the suggestion that I've got the, the, money? That's, that's not a valid point of order, councillor. Councillor Tarrant, you have the call. So I, I caution my fellow councillors to, to remove these, um, to, to even want to defer and to remove these things, because, I mean, as it as it stands now we have an opportunity to have diversity. And to have diversity, we need to have people from all walks of life and from all levels of economical, eco-economical, oh, sorry, socio-economical um, environments. Because that gives us a true council who has an understanding of um, different um, opportunities that are available to people. I just think it's restrictive. So I'm, I'm actually for this motion, thank you. Are there any other speakers on the item? Councillor Noonan. Just a, a question if I may. Question, yep. Um, 
with the with the motion, the uh, alternative motion as moved by Councillor Andrew, yes, um, and the allowances that that mem uh, councillors would be allowed to to claim, is that log of claims a public document? So would the would it, would it be would it be at the end of the year? You know, councillor Luciano claimed this much. Sure. I mean, it's. Uh, I, I'll take the point. I understand. Yeah, yeah, I understand yeah. the intent of your question. So, as it currently stands, the total claimed by the elected member cohort is reported in the annual but annual report. It's not individualised. Um, if you wanted to see councillor individual claimed, that comes through in the accounts paid as part of the agenda. Um, you could go through that and individually work out the total per elected member. Does that answer your question? Yep. Councillor Clues, a question? Am I able to move an amendment? Uh, I'm lost. No, you already... No, uh, no, no, you can't, because no. you've already spoken to the officer. Question then, please, if I may. Question, yes. Um, can... Uh, perhaps through the chair, the CEO, might be able to um, express if any of these items are above that legislated and if so, what and by how much? Uh, through you, Shire President, um, the Act itself is o quite open. Um, so Section 598 talks about the fact that um, Basically, a, a councillor can seek at a reimbursement approved by the local government. So, whatever. It, yeah, yeah. And then there's further guidance provided by the Sellers and, and Allowances Tribunal, which basically talks about um, Regulation 311B, and there's a range of things which are basically included as allowable expenses and one of those things um, is for a person to travel from the person's place of residence to work to a meeting and back if the distance is travelled referred to is more than 100 kilometres for the person. So there's basically there's a range of things that um, a councillor is eligible to claim under the Act in terms of reimbursement and then the regulations provide for what types of things those are. Perfect, thank you kindly. That couldn't have gone better. A follow-up, if I may. I just would like to confirm, then, that I'm hearing correctly that the legislation only speaks of eligibilities and allowables. Legislation does not dictate that we must provide expenses for these things. Am I, am I hearing correctly? The, the legislation is in the Act. Oh, sorry. The legislation is in the Act says a mechanism must be provided. The regulations and specifically through the salaries and allowances tribunal dictates in some manner the minimum requirement uh, that's that's completely contradictory to what we've just heard though that none of that was mentioned as a minimum we were told things were eligible we were told things were allowable to be called expenses there was no mention from the explanation from the act to say that things must at all the, required the, or the anything Chief Executive like that. Officer. Through the Shire President, um, the, the Act provides, the, so the legislation provides that reimbursements will be made available to, lo to elected members that incur in expenses. The regulations then talk to the specifics about what those expenses would be and travel is included as one of those allowable expenses. So. The, the Act provides the mechanism whereby a, an elected member can be reimbursed for an expense. The regulations then talk to the types of things that are an allowable expense. So one provides the power, the other provides the detail. Thank, thank you. So I think my interpretation is correct that, that this is allowable or there's some mechanism which is possible Sorry. but it's not necessarily legislated that we must provide any uh, compensation for anything? Not, not, not entirely, Councillor. Well, can you please let me know then from my original question, what does the legislation mandate 
that we must and are obliged and have to recuperate or, or pay back as an expense. My question was was one was two parted. One, what are the expenses that are legislated to as requirements? And, and and my second part was, how much further, if any, than that legislation have we gone with our policy? Sure. Through you, Shire President, if I'm interpreting your question correctly, Councillor. So the the legislation says a council member who inter incurs an expense of the kind prescribed as being an expense is to be re reimbursed by all local governments or which may be approved by any local government for reimbursement by the local government which has been approved by the local government for reimbursement is entitled to be reimbursed for the expense so it's an entitlement under the act and and our our fees aren't recognized as reimbursement for those things in the act they're an allowance for, like they're a sitting fee, essentially. Um, they're not a travel reimbursement. Uh, all right, and any f uh, question, Deputy President? Uh, question, thank you, Mr. President. I heard mention of a 100 kilometre radius in that regulation. Could I please get clarification on that again, please? Or, or what the context was of the 100 kilometre radius? Uh, through you, Shire President. The regulation 31, um, talks to um, if a person does not live or work in the local government district or an adjoining local government district the actual cost in relation to a journey from that person's place of residence or work and back um, or so this is where the re a reinvestment is entitled or if the distance travelled referred to in subparagraph 1 is more than 100 kilometres for the person to travel from the outer boundary of an adjoining local government district to the meeting and back to that boundary. So it does, it effectively means that if you don't live in this local, if you don't live in this local government, it, it places some limits. So effectively you can't live in Geraldton and claim a travel expense back here. So it places some upper limits. All right, any further? Uh, Councillor Noonan. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. I I uh, agree with Councillor Terentroy on this item. Um, I think that if we choose to either claim or not to claim, that's up to us. That's a, you know personal decision that we can make, and um, you know it's very much the same. If we choose to donate money to this charity or that charity, it's in effect the same thing. Uh, I think that it would be unwise for us to um, try and play around with the legislation from the state government which makes very clear you know, the certain things that can be claimed, certain things that can't be claimed, the fact that everything um, is traceable, everything's public, um, many of the specific things, uh, to travel and expenses, need to be approved either by the CEO and or the, the Shire President. So it's all, it's a very public, um, defined process for legitimate expenses which um, people are entitled to claim. And it's not about us, it, it's, you know, we're, we would potentially, if we were to knock this back or play around with it, we're we're impacting on the ability or the opportunity for other people uh, to be able to put their hand up and, and run for council. And um, so for that reason, I, um, I'm happy to support the amended um, motion as moved by Councillor Andrew. 
All right, are there any further speakers for or against? Or question Councillor McCleary? Um, just through the Chair, it's my understanding that the fees or the allowances that we've paid are treated as a taxable income, so they're put on top of your tax return. Is that correct? Yes. Are there any further speakers to the item? Well, I'll, I'll say a few words. Um, I agree with um, reflecting on my own circumstances, the um, motion as moved by Councillor Andrew. Um, I have not claimed a cent since being shy president, and even before that, I never claimed. Um, but I do sort of support the idea in terms of in the future, there may be a shy president who would use that facility. Um, and th there are some weeks where I could travel easily well into the hundreds of kilometres, um, but there would have to be an accountable mechanism for which that worked if it was to be any simpler than the, the, the simple claim form that we currently have. Um, but listening to the discussion tonight, um, I, I agree with a lot of it. I'd like to see, in some cases, a bit of a tightening in terms of, you know, if, if you're going along to a community meeting, you shouldn't be claiming it. Um, but I suppose it's up to each individual to make that assessment whether they wish to do that or not. But this is a significant tightening on the policy that we currently do and have in place. And I think it's a, it, is a, it is a big improvement, meaning there's, there's more requirements for you to be eligible for that reimbursement. If you're the nominated councillor going along, that's fine. But if you're just going along because, oh, I want to, well, I'm sorry, you're not eligible for that anymore. So certainly an improvement. I gather it's not perfect. Um, but given the nature of this policy, I assume it will be reviewed in a year's time because there is a bit of risk associated with it. So we could probably get further advice on the statutory requirements around this and then have a look at them. But I, I, I would encourage support of this policy tonight just to bring it up to a higher specification than the current policy that we currently have. All right, are there any further speakers? A, a, a question? question, Councillor Clues? Thank you. <coughs> me. Has, has something changed that's, that's altered the time frame on the reviewing of this policy in recent years? Uh, the Shire has since adopted an updated risk f matrix framework. Um, the timeline on this policy uh, lost us. So we can find that out for you, Councillor. Thank you, I appreciate it. It, yeah. it looks like it would be up to a maximum of five years if that was what it was, that's the longest time, but it would also be at council's discretion. Yeah, I'd, I'd just say there's a significant change in the um, historical time frames on review, so... Um yes. So it was only reviewed in May last year, but prior to that it was four years, and prior to that it was three years. So it has been a little bit inconsistent, but under the new print, printing and our new risk matrix framework, it should have a, an allocated time frame based on its risk component. So, so this is, I guess the second part of the question is, what, what is the new time frame? The governance officer is just clarifying that. This policy is on a four-year cycle, but it can be reviewed Thank earlier at Council's Thank discretion. Thank you. So but I, I don't think Council asked for this, so it wasn't at Council's discretion. So our uh, no, next question is, what's brought this back to us so early after having seen it already? Um, through the senior leadership team meeting, there has been a discussion raised by a few of us around the claims that have been made under the existing policy. So this has been brought forward review it. 
I don't believe it was actually part of its time frame. No, so, so then can you confirm which claims it is that have been removed? Um, sorry? It's, it's mostly just clarification around what is and isn't eligible. So the current policy was a bit vague in terms of what was and wasn't. So there was a bit of interpretation implied a part of it. But so, this is... So to confirm, because I, I first asked... The first time you answered me, you, you said it was to change some of the things because there were some concerns about what was being paid out. I've asked you what was that being was paid out. That was an individual It's been, it's been removed, and you're now you're saying nothing's been removed. We've just cleaned up some wording. Is that correct? There has been changes to the wording and clarifications of what is and isn't eligible. Yeah, so, so my original question was what's been removed from eligibility? Well, in a councillor who attends a community meeting not as the representative is no longer eligible to claim that travel. Thank you, that's what I was asking. Thank you. Also, yep. um, while I'm there, um, I notice in the background there's the Act, uh, the mention of the Act that requires um, us to review the decision, but there's no mention of uh, the number in the Act where we can find, or anyone at home can find, the um, specific information relating to the subject. So can, can we have that, please? So 5.98. All right, there's no further speakers. Uh, Councillor Dillon. At risk of people thinking I'm not worthy of my sitting fee. Um, <laughs> sorry, uh, I'll just uh, concur with uh, Councillor Noonan and Councillor Terentroy. I don't see any problem with anything in this uh, whatsoever. Uh, thank you, uh, Councillor Andrew, for the uh, earlier amendment, and uh, I'd encourage the councillors to vote for it as presented. Thank you. All right, no further speakers. Councillor Andrew, do you wish to close? No? All right, I'll put that to the vote. Those in favour? And those against? And that's carried 7-1. Okay, we move on to item 14.1, the nomination of new road names affected by the Bunbury Outer Ring Road. Is there a mover for that motion? Before we do, can I move a procedural motion? I can't find it in there though. What I would like to do is bring up 14.9 and deal with that uh, and yes. bring it up the agenda um, so that the people in the front row can get home in time for dinner. There is a, <laughs> so I haven't got the standing orders in front of me, there is a procedural motion for you to do that, councillor. Yes. Thank you for that uh, advisement, councillor Andrew. At my discretion, I will... <laughs> Bring item 14.9 up for Council to consider um, immediately. Okay, so we'll now deal with item 14.9, the proposed extractive industry hard rock renewal lots 2644 and 348, Jules Road, Jalorup. Is there a mover for that item? Councillor McCleary, is there a second? Can I'm Sorry, with you're moving with amendment? Yeah. Yep. I'd like to look at um, item H in relation to the uh, limits imposed on the truck movements. Yes. So what change are you making to that condition? Yeah. So I think there's some wording with the CEO. Sure. The staff do have that wording. Um, we'll get that on the board before we move further. Sorry? Sure. Yeah, we'll just deal, just deal with this first. Yeah. Um, and I'll come to you.
Councillor, is that the changes to the condition? Yep. Is there a seconder for that alternative recommendation? Councillor Noonan. Councillor McCleary. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Look, um, I realise going forward with um, this extractive industry is that most of the access will be onto Hasty Road and onto the bore in the in the future time frame. And this is um, this this motion allows for certain times when there's peak loading to be able to meet demand, and I think that's what we're about is allowing industry to to meet some of the things in there. So. Hence the, the reason for the, the change in the motion. Thanks. <laughs> Councillor Noonan. Uh, thank you, Mr President, and thank you, Councillor uh, McCleary, for your amendment. I think that's a fair and reasonable amendment. When you look, break it down to a 10-hour you know, day, it's really um, looking at two additional truck movements an hour, two to three additional truck movements an hour, which is not... Um, uh, I don't think that's going to place such an enormous change on what residents are currently already um, used to. Um, and I know that most complaints, well, certainly many of the complaints, don't actually relate to so much to the truck movements. It's more to the impact of blasting. And, um, whenever a charge goes off which we're, we're some and, and that's un, an unpredictable thing it's un, unpredictable for the quarries because um, sometimes it will depending on the rock and position of um, uh, fractures it, it'll have a, a greater vibration than the same charge in another location um, so I don't see a, a problem with the 20% extra um, on at peak times so I'd, I think support that amendment can I move an amendment I had a couple of questions but if I could set aside standing orders so that I could ask them to the applicant It's not within our standing orders to allow. Okay. All right, I still have a couple of questions then that hopefully the CEO can answer. So, um, the trucks will be going down Hasty's Road onto the bore, so I'm talking about post bore. How far along Hasty's Road will the trucks be travelling from the quarry to actually get onto the bore. So what's the stretch of road that they'll be travelling down? And how many houses is it? And is that encompassing any of the crossings or um, the specific crossings for kids entering and exiting into the grammar school? The Director of Infrastructure and Development. The exit point onto the bore will be constructed into a cul-de-sac area. There's one house affected that's also entering close to that cul-de-sac area and it doesn't cross any child. Um, there, there shouldn't be any crossover of any children in that area. So the, the bore will provide a single opportunity for the quarry to gain access directly onto it for <coughs> their purpose only. It's not for through traffic. So there shouldn't be any any um, crossover at all. Okay. And <laughs> Councillor McCleary, sorry, we, Councillor Andrew, did you have any further questions? Um, was it the intention of shy staff for those truck movements post bore to be completely unrestricted? Um. The Director of Infrastructure and Development. Uh, there's no current restriction 
um, for truck numbers, and that is the intent of that that clause. Yeah. But H is a restriction. It is now, but the current approval has no restriction. This is applying a restriction while Jules Rose's Road is being utilised for the truck movement, and then that restriction is re removed once the alternative route onto the new Hasty's hook onto the bore mm -hmm. is implemented. So at that point, there is no truck restriction in these recommendations. Okay. And I just have one more question, which may lead to one more. Have we had traffic counts um, along, Jules's, along Jules Road that is able to tell us how many truck movements have been um, occurring? Only because I note that the applicant said that they've been doing under 78. So I'm trying to understand why you would need the 78 plus the 20% loading? The Director of Infrastructure and Development. Uh, two questions there. I'm unable to answer whether there's been any traffic counts. Yep. Uh, the second part is, um, I've forgotten, what was your second part of the question again? Oh, so if they've been well under the 78, yes, why they would need yeah. 78 plus an extra allowance? That provides the, the applicant the opportunity to apply for a tender that may exceed that if there is one special project that may come around that allows more truck movements than 78. The applicant has advised that there's, they're, they're working well under the 78 currently, but should there be that 20% wriggle room allowable, it, it stops them having to come back to council to just have that extra um, should they need to. If that is, exceeds more than that um, 93, they will still come back to council for approval to exceed that for specific contracts only in that interim period until the bore is, is through. Okay, so will it come back to council or will the CEO be able to sign it off because it says about getting approval by the CEO? Um, and second of all, the variation is, a, is um, allowable by the CEO. So if in the instance that they did get a contract that required more truck movements, wouldn't they just be able to apply for a variation of truck movements for the um, time span of the contract? So I don't really understand why this is um, prohibitively restrictive to begin with. It, that's true on both parts. Um, it just, it, I guess it gives that uh, applicant enough room to be able to move within a 20% increase from the 78. Um, and then if there's anything substantial that comes in past that, we can come back to the CEO for approval. The answer is yes, they can come back to the CEO for approval regardless. But what this does is allow them just that extra room to move within that approve, um, approval condition. Is Sorry, is the CEO able to approve um, it up to any percentage so he could unilaterally approve 150 truck movements a day? Or is there a cap on what the CEO can approve and then what has to come back to council? There is no cap currently, sorry, I threw the chair. There is no cap currently and that's not intended because um, because of the market at the moment, these things are coming around pretty quickly and are usually uh, increased over a small window. So it might be a two week window, a four week window. Um, we ha th there is no intended cap to be put on that so that the applicant can then meet the requirements of whatever that, that job or that tender could be. But it is not something that we'll entertain over long periods of time. So while there, there is no cap, it is just allowing them in the market to tender and be competitive um, with their peers. So, Shire President, if I can just add too, so at, at the way that all of the extractive industry conditions are written at this point in time around truck movements, it, it does allow for the operator to come back and seek my um, approval in writing. Um, I think what I'd be prepared to approve without coming back to council will be quite limited. Ultimately, it would depend, 
it's going to be the situation. It's going to be on the particular circumstances of each application, dependent upon exactly where it is in the shire, the potential for impacting other houses, the potential for the increased number, the potential time period. So, I mean, I think it's safe to say I'm. I would only entertain things of a fairly low impactful nature that I would in that would I be contemplate approving in writing by myself. Ultimately, if I thought that it was just a step too far, I'd be saying that has to come back to council. Question? Oh, Councillor Clues. Oh, sorry. I had up while for a while. <laughs> Thank you. If I can move an amendment, please, to return that paragraph back to its original form. All right, so Councillor Clues, an amendment. To condition H, the original officer's recommendation. We'll get that on the board. Is that thank you, the wording yes. there, Councillor? Yes, thank you. Is there a seconder for that amendment? Uh, the Deputy President, Councillor Sciano. Councillor Clues. Thank you. Uh, yeah, clearly this is the sticking point on this item, so I think this is probably the best way we can get a chance to debate um, the, the, the point itself, um, and Council can decide from either of the options that were available to us. Uh, instead of just having the one option on the table. Um, yeah, so for me, I actually think H was fine. Um, I think it, uh, it provides everything it needed to provide and, um, and it allowed more than enough for the current time. Um, I'm, I'm quite concerned moving forward, uh, knowing the amount of construction that's going on around that area, um, if traffic ends up diverted here, there and everywhere while the bore's going in over the next two to three years, um, where all these trucks are going to go exactly um, is, is potentially going to become an issue. So I, I think this is something that would be best served by the Shire being in regular contact with the applicant and uh, just having a good relationship moving forward. And, and it, with the original... Uh, number H there, we're not refusing anything at all. In fact, we're committing to um, being supportive and, and making adjustments as necessary to suit business needs. Um, all it does is it keeps us in the loop so we can do any changes we need to make in the background to work with the applicant to get their trucks out the door. Um, I just think it was a good, sensible uh, paragraph as it was written and, and we'd all love to see more business happening and more people employed and it's all good stuff but um, I don't think it's something we should just blanketly okay particularly at a time when we don't know what that area is going to be looking like over the next few years so um, yeah I, I'm, I'm happy with it the way it was I prefer it this way uh, it, it gives us all the options to do everything we want to do I like it the deputy president thank you mr. president um, I mean I was thinking about foreshadowing the original motion just in case we, we got to this point, but um, I'm much more comfortable with, with 78. And I think the three things that we get um, with any extractive industry licence, uh, particularly from the community, is dust, noise and trucks, right? And truck movements are not only impacting the 100 or so metres around the site where people can be impacted by dust, and obviously it's always mitigated, but um, it's a matter of public safety when we start moving 90-odd trucks a day. And interestingly enough, I can't see the times of operations in the actual recommendation. I know we've often had that in the recommendations as part of the conditions, and I respect that obviously. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's not a condition, though. So is it 90 trucks over 10 hours? Is it 90 trucks over 6 hours? I mean, it is in the attachments, but... Um, 
from what I've heard from the questions that have been asked, and um, Councillor Andrew has asked some great questions, and my question list has gotten a lot shorter. <laughs> um, but um, I've always been aware the CEO obviously has the capacity to approve additional truck movements, and I think what we still have in H, and like Councillor Clues has said, is there is a obviously there's a day to day the 78 limit. If the applicant requires an increase in that, potentially for uh, a contract or tender, they can apply for that. And I mean, going up from 78 to um, 93, what was it, 93? Yep, it's off the thing now. Um, I don't think that is unreasonable for the CEO to um, approve at the time for a short period of time if that is necessary by the applicant. But the result is we've got trucks driving over the crossover at Hastie's Road. Um, you know, we've got a community there still. So we need to be reasonable about what is fair on the community around truck movements. Um, so I am happy for it to stay. I prefer it to stay at 78, um, but otherwise the continuation of the licence in the industry, extractive industry support. So that's all from me. Are there any speakers against the amendment? Any speakers for? Councillor Clues, you wish to close? I'll put that amendment to the vote. Those in favour? Those against, and that's carried 6-2. That becomes part of the substantive motion. Are there any speakers for or against? No. Councillor McCleary, do you wish to close? Thank you, Mr President. I don't think I can say much more on this uh, amendment. We've had enough of a discussion, lots of questions. Um, I think there's there's room in there. Um, it was probably a bit of wiggle room to uh, be a bit more adaptive to demand, but uh, this is the motion now, so uh, I'd like to put it Point to of the order. Vote. Point of order, Councillor. Let, uh, let me just find it so I've got the wording correct. I think um, we might be adversely. Um, Reflecting adversely on a decision of council there. I take your point of order within reason, in that it probably wasn't, it wasn't exactly favourable, but it wasn't exactly detrimental to the local government in its decision making abilities. It was, it was more of just a, a comment. Um, but I do take it as it is. It, it is an adverse reflection at the end of the day. So, Councillor McClure, I'll probably ask you to withdraw that comment. I withdraw the comment sure. in relation to the decision and um, I believe we should just put it to the vote as it stands. Sure. Thank you for that, Councillor. Um, All right. Do you wish to continue summing up, Councillor? Sure. All right, I'll put that item to the vote. Those in favour? And that's carried unanimous. Okay, with that dealt with, we return to item 14.1 and continue business as prescribed in the agenda. So item 14.1, nomination of new road names, roads affected by the Bunbury Outer Ring Road. Is there a mover for that item? Councillor McCleary, is there a seconder? Councillor Andrew. Councillor McCleary. Thank you, Mr President. Um, this has been to council before. It's gone out for consultative um, with the community, uh, and I think we've got some some good indications back from the community. So, um, yeah, look, I'm all for this motion. Councillor Andrew. Are there any speakers against the item? Speakers for? Any speakers, Councillor McCleary, do you wish to close? Thank you, Mr. President. Um, yeah, look, there's not much more to add to that. Let's put it to the vote. I'll put that item to the vote. Those in favour? And those against? And that's carried 7 1. Item 14.2, tender 2207, Hastie's Road, curbing and drainage, budget variation. 
There's a recommendation there. Is there a mover? Councillor McCleary. Is there a seconder? Councillor Noonan. Councillor McCleary. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, I do note that uh, this is kind of a reason reasonable size variation and it was above what our limits were. Um, it, um, we've had to adjust budgets from other works to, to fit this in. The, um, there's still a contribution from Main Roads and the Regional Roads Group and that this is um, reflective, well, from my meeting earlier in the week with um, costs of construction going up with a lot of councils and having to look at their funding regimes. So I, I think it uh, at least gets the job done. A bit disappointing that another job drops off or gets deferred for another year, but I think we've got to work with this. Councillor Noonan. Uh, yeah, I concur, Councillor McCleary. Um, I think it's an important um, piece of work that needs to be done. It's uh, a major entrance to uh, our Shire's biggest employer. Um, so I think that it's, um, you know, and a, a, a marketing point for the Shire, so I think that it's, uh, you know, it, it is what it is. The costs of material and roadworks have gone up and um, that's just where we are at the moment. So I'll certainly support um, this, this motion. Are there any speakers against the motion? Councillor Clues. A question, if I may. Question, Councillor. Yes. Sorry, I, um, I didn't see anywhere in the uh, documents that a, a job will be falling off for for this one. Can someone confirm what it is where we're cutting the, off? The director of community and corporate. Thank you for um, your question, Councillor, through the Shah President. Um, so there's money being um, diverted from the, the, the Merton Road Capital Works project and it's been allocated to this project. So I wouldn't like to suggest at this time Merton Road won't go ahead. Um, what the reason why we chose Merton Road is because that particular capital works project has no grant funding commitment attached to it for this financial year. So that particular project is funded fully out of municipal funds. So it's easier to be able to do any variation on any capital work. Um, from that project. Probably what we, w what we could do is, after the mid-year budget review, is to look at how the other projects um, are tracking in terms of resourcing. If there's any residual, we can put it back onto Merton Road and see if we can get that work done. Thank you. And, and so that was scheduled for this financial year, Merton Road? Yeah, correct. Um, I, yes. I guess then on that uh, similar vein, then I'll ask, um, how are we tracking? I know last financial year we significantly underspent uh, from our budget and had carryover. How, how are we tracking so far this year in that regard? The Chief Executive Officer. Uh, this year's, so through you, Shire President, uh, this year's not anything like last year, <laughs> Councillor. Um, we did underspend last year in terms of some of our maintenance, um, road maintenance projects. This year, um, our entire program of works whether or not it be capital, uh, capital road, pro road capital projects and or road maintenance projects have been impacted, I guess, by our, our asset and technical area staffing. Um, what that has caused us to do is to basically look at all of our projects on this year's program of works, um, prioritise those projects that have external grant funding tied to it, and this is an example where um, there's already uh, a contract let and LRCI funding that's been committed to this project by council. Delaying this project um, would potentially place that funding at risk. So we've prioritised those projects that where there's external funding tied to it that we don't want to lose. Um, we'll effectively um, look at where we're at in terms of the program of works um, in January and February and then we'll bring effectively we will provide an update to council on what that would look like in terms of both the capital and the maintenance projects that we expect to be able to finish and not finish in this financial year. Are there any further speakers on the item? The Deputy President. Thank you Mr President. I think just on that note um, and looking at page 68 I think it's just worth noticing that there 
was an original a, a remaining balance of eighteen and a half thousand from the original ring, ring fenced funding. So the actual actual sum that is being reshifted from Merton Road is only twenty seven thousand five hundred and forty one. So the the budget is not necessarily filling the full brunt of the forty six thousand and forty one dollars. Um, and obviously there's a few more comments in there around um, revising the project for Merton Road. On that note, um, just using the opportunity to speak to Item, I mean, we I think we've set a very high community expectation that this project's underway and, and, and on, the, on the go. Um, I think we've managed to secure obviously quite a bit of funding and additional funding from main roads. Um, I think it, simply, I think at the end of the day, I'm, I'm eager to go ahead with it. Um, but just in, in respect to the actual impact on the budget, I think it's, it's somewhat less than what is probably made out to be in the, in the final recommendation. Question, Councillor. Thank you, yes, just to, uh, it's on, so similar to what I was just mentioning. I, I see the year-to-date operating expenses on page 999 of the agenda would seem to have us once again tracking uh, significantly lower than the budget uh, and in fact lower than last financial year so so my, my, my question was actually how how are we tracking um, you know you know last year we had significant uh, carryover that would suggest this year we're heading down the same path if our budget versus actual operating expenses are significantly under is that not the case Sorry, where are you quoting from, Councillor? Page 999 of the agenda on the website, the year-to-date operating expenses, budget versus actual. It's, not, it's right from the agenda, I, I don't know what to tell you. <laughs> you want a different item, Councillor? Or? Uh, yes, but I'm discussing the, the budget items. Sh sure, all right. Yeah. So my question was previously, about the, our operating expenses and how we're going um, uh, budget compared to what we're actually spending. So are we going to have, are we looking at having carryover this year like we did last year? That was my question. The Director of Community and Corporate. Thank you. Hello, yes, you're quite right. So looking at the financial statements you're just referring to, the year-to-date expenditure is tracking below expected, albeit um, at this point in time, given some, some of the complexities we're up against against these capital works and the labour that's required to make sure we can carry those out. Um, I wouldn't want to presume until we'd at least um, reviewed it through the mid-year budget review. Thank you, yes. I, 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 the, the point I, I was, I guess, making and, and trying to clear up with myself was that knowing that we had a significant carryover last year um, and suspecting that perhaps not so much has changed in only a few months that we may be still carrying carryover, that that few tens of thousands of dollars for um, uh, that we're having to shift to get this done. Um, it isn't going to be a big problem financially because uh, we're, we're looking like having carryover again. So uh, I don't think it's any concern whatsoever that we have that little bit shifted from one spot to another. Thank you, Councillor. Are there any other speakers on the item? I counted it as it. Councillor McClure, do you wish to close? Thank you, Mr. President. Um, look, the decision on this is to whether we approve this uh, variation or not. So I think we should just put this to the vote. I'll put that to the vote. Those in favour? And those against? So that was carried unanimous. Item 14.3, the Bush Fire Brigade Facility Demolition and Construction. Is there a mover for that recommendation? Councillor Dillon? A seconder, Councillor Tarantroy. Councillor Dillon. Thank you, Mr. President. I'll keep it short and sweet. Basically, if we want to build a new one, we have to get rid of the old one. Thank you. <laughs> Councillor Tarantroy. I concur. Thank you. I'm liking it. Anyone to speak against the item? Speakers for. The Deputy President. Uh, more of a question, just in regards to the consultation with the Bushfire Brigade around the process and, and how this will affect 
um, the service that they provide during the construction and demolition period. I just note that in the consultation and engagement section of the report, there's no external consultation and simply internal consultation is the application was referred to various internal departments for further consideration. So where are the, where is the brigade sitting at the moment or where, how are they feeling about how they'll be able to continue to provide the service during that period? The Director of Infrastructure and Development. Thanks for your question. Um, this is actually affecting this season as well. So they've actually already moved out of that shed in preparation for this process. So that, that's all actually being covered off for this season. And if that continues into next season, then we will follow the same suit. Um, yeah, thank you for that. That's a great response. I don't think I need to add anything to debate. Are there any speakers on the item for or against? Councillor Noonan. Uh, I'd, I'd just like to um, commend this item again. I think it's a, a great opportunity for the Shire and um, to follow up and make the point that the um, Jalorit Brigade has been very, very accommodating, particularly um, uh, Jeff McDougall and Glenis Malatesta to, to house the, the appliances. Um, and it's great to see such a proactive um, brigade and uh, you know I, I think it's a really good really good project so thank you Councillor Dillon for moving that motion. Are there any other speakers? Councillor Dillon do you wish to close? Oh, just quickly Mr President yeah look it is a um, fantastic project that um, uh, everybody in the the whole Shire could embrace because it will be a sort of central training hub so uh, yep Let's knock it down, so to speak. Thank you. I'll put that to the vote, those in favour. And that's carried unanimous. Item 14.4, outbuilding Boynup Lions Club, lot 209, 36 Bridge Street, Boynup. Is there a mover for that recommendation? Councillor Tarantroy, a seconder. Councillor McCleary, Councillor Tarantroy. Moved as read. Nothing to add. Councillor McCleary. Likewise, I think there's uh, enough in the in the wording of the um, motion, so and the documents behind it. Thanks. Are there any speakers against the motion? Speakers for. Councillor Tarantroy, do you wish to close? No, let's move to vote on it. I'll put that to the vote. Those in favour? And that's carried unanimous. Item 14.5, multi-purpose centre, library and digital hub, lot 6059, lot 101, Tiffany Centre, Dow Yellop. Moved Councillor Clues, seconded Councillor Schiano. Councillor Clues. The Deputy President. What a fantastic facility. No, thank you. No, look, it's, I'm looking for the plans and where this has got to where it is. Um, I think it should be a project to be exceptionally proud of. Um, the, the site itself, well, the plans that have been put together and the way that it's been laid out into those three areas, I think it's great. And how it works into the facility that we've only opened um, the other month, I think it's fantastic. And the cherry on top, to have the state government back a project like this as an election commitment and follow through um, is, is fantastic. So I don't, I don't think there's much more to add there. I think there's some really ex exciting plans there. Um, I hope we have a really robust discussion around um, the use of that site. Um, but yeah, that's, that's it. Are there any speakers against the motion? Speakers for Councillor McCleary. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, one of the significant things in this is it, it's creating a bit of a hub in Dow Yellup, one of our biggest areas in the Shire. It also um, puts the Shire, a Shire facility there that can be used by officers of the Shire to communicate with their local community, the largest community in, in the Shire. Uh, and I think, as pointed out, this is going to be a terrific building. Um, it's got substantial um, support from state government. 
Um, there will be some ongoing costs that will affect future budgets, which we know about. But yeah, look, it, it, it just puts that image in, into Del Yellup and gives us a facility there that's worthy of that size down. Are there any other speakers for or against? Oh, a bit of a crack. This is a exciting building and you look around much of the southwest and then you don't see a building like what is proposed here. It just It's going to be very flexible, future-proof, uh, very excited to see what comes of it. Um, in some of those spaces it, it's going to be an absolutely amazing function space. The potential there is just awesome. The, the digital space as well, having a dedicated youth hub as well, um, oh, it's just going to be a great building. But the bigger picture there, that that, that big puzzle piece of that land that's there. We've got the skate park, which we opened only a few weeks ago, and I you know, drive past that regularly just to see what's going on, and it's always got people on it. Um, we've got a proposed nature space to eventually come along the side of it. Um, and also there is the, the pump track, which is next to, the, um, next to the, the skate park there, which is another piece of the puzzle. Um, I'm, I'm very, very pleased to share that um, we received notice not long ago that we'd received funding of $67,000 from the state government to go towards that project. Um, so that's just another piece of the puzzle which um, is, is, getting, is getting done. So, yeah, probably gone a little bit off topic there, but um, this multi-purpose Senate, no, let's, let's, let's move forward with it. It's great. All right, any other speakers? Councillor Clues, do you wish to close? I'll put that item to the vote, those in favour. And that's carried unanimous. <coughs> item 14.6, advertisement of draft local planning policies. There is six policies as consideration of this motion tonight. Is there a mover for that? Councillor McCleary. A seconder? Councillor Terentroy. Councillor McCleary. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, I think this is fantastic that we're getting a bit of um, documents out there on our, our planning tools to give a bit more guidance in uh, policy to the staff and um, I, I commend the work that's been done in the background for these policies. I'm looking forward to the feedback when they go out and be advertised. So um, this motion simply puts it out into the community and then it comes back to Council. Councillor Taran Troy. Not a lot to say, I think, Peter said it all. Um, I just think this makes things a lot easier and I think having that, putting it out to the community, as Peter said, is the way to go and looking forward to it coming back to Council. Are there any speakers against the item? Speakers for? The Deputy President. I'm just glad to see on page four of the Extractive Industry Licence Batter slopes with a gradient of one to ten to one to six, uh, and just you know we have really faced um, this. We've been presented with a number of challenges by not having an extractive industries um, pol policy, planning policy in place, um, particularly as the market has become far more aggressive um, in recent years, and um, applicants have wanted to do more with the little space they have. So I'm really great to see that. I'm really happy to see that in there. Um, quite happy with the policy. I mean, the significant tree policy. Another one of. I mean, there's quite a few policies here, obviously, but significant tree one. And I was having a look through the process in that. And I think that's a really great process. Um, it, it could have been. It could have been something that um, became too hard to deal with easily. Um, but I think what's been presented uh, is a really great middle ground with a great process that allows people to register those trees. Um, allow, there's a process in place, it's, it's black and white. So um, very happy to um, commend the, the policies that are presented in this item. Are there any other speakers on the item? No, Councillor McClure, do you wish to close? Thank you, Mr. President, and I thank Councillor Siano for reminding me of the extractive industry clauses. Um, my uh, talk around the traps is this is something that all the other shires are looking at and what we've imposed in these, so it'll be good to see the outcome of that come through. All right, I'll put that to the vote. Those in favour? And that's carried unanimous. Item 14.7, Bushfire Policies Review. 
Is there a mover for those? Councillor Dillon. A seconder. Councillor Tarantroy. Councillor Dillon. Yes, thank you, Mr. President. Look, uh, this has been a long time coming, as uh, some of the executive staff would know. Um, as part of my role on council, I'm uh, very heavily involved and very committed to the BFAC um, committee. Um, we've got some wonderful volunteers who, uh, uh, may I, uh, and I say this in the nicest possible way, grizzled veterans of the uh, the firefighting game, and uh, certain, and they probably admit that themselves, uh, have put a lot of time in reviewing our policy structure here and um, going over it with a fine tooth comb, coming back to uh, to the executive and, and working. It, it's been a, a, a big process and quite a traumatic process because some of these uh, policies that they've now had to work within, uh, they've had to sort of get used to. But I give them full credit for working with the staff, the staff full credit for working with our uh, with our volleys and uh, I commend the, um, the policy as, as put to council. Councillor Tarantroy. I think the main point here is that this is an opportunity for modernisation of the, the um, emergency services policies and, um, and because we've had the stakeholders working on it, the, the volunteers who are involved in this that have to use the policy, I think it's the only way to go. I think it sets um, the key areas of responsibility um, and provides more responsiveness and effective decision making within this volunteer service, which is an outstanding thing for our community. Councillor Andrew. Thank you. It's more of a comment. I don't know what it looks like um, on the agenda that's on the screen, but this is listed as officer's recommendation 14.8 and this should be 14.7. Yeah, there is a slight numbering issue in the agenda, uh, but we are on 14.7. Um, yep. Thank you, Councillor. Are there any speakers against the item? Speakers for? Right. Councillor Dillon, do you wish to close? I'll put that item to the vote. Those in favour? And that's carried unanimous. Item 14.8, the Bushfire Advisory BFAC Terms of Reference. Is there a mover? Councillor Andrew? Councillor Andrew moving with the amendment. We'll get that on the board. Your amendment, Councillor? Yep. All right. Is there a mover for that amendment, uh, a seconder for that amendment, sorry? Councillor Tarantroy? Councillor Andrew? Thank you. Um, as discussed on Wednesday, um, this just brings this um, policy in line with all of our other um, committees, um, whereby councillors in attendance are able to ask questions um, of the chair, um, bearing in mind that the chair obviously of the BFAC isn't a, a member of council himself. Um, I still think that, um, that it's a good positive move to enable all councillors um, regardless of being a representative of the BFAC or not, um, to be able to ask questions. Councillor Tarantroy. I have nothing more to add. Are there any speakers against the motion? Speakers for? Councillor Clues. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I went along to a previous BFAC meeting as a uh, councillor not as a member of that committee and was was uh, I asked some questions and we had some good conversation and uh, not sure I was at the table I think I was just away from the table but it was all fine and uh, went quite well so uh, yeah I don't see any reason why that shouldn't be uh, part of policy that's seemed like a good thing at the time are there any other speakers for or against Councillor Andrew, do you wish to close? 
I'll put that item to the vote. Those in favour? And that's carried unanimous. Item 14.9 we have dealt with earlier this evening. So we'll move to item 14.10, the disposal of Shire of Capel Asset, the Jalorup Bush Fire Brigade Shed. Is there a mover for that item? Councillor McCleary, is there a seconder? Councillor Andrew? Councillor McCleary. Thank you, Mr President. Um, yeah, not sure how much we get for it. I think there was a bit of a statement that it could have been the shed in Balloon up, but uh, <laughs> we'll reject that one. But uh, yeah, look, it's a way of getting rid of something and, and probably in, in our recycling thing, let's hope we, it goes to another, another area of scrap metal or something like that. Councillor Andrew. A question. Councillor Blue's question. Um, doesn't point two contradict point one? Um, Are we choosing one here or? No. Um, the <laughs> Chief Executive Officer. I'm through you, Show President. The, the existing budget for the demolition and construction so demolition of the old facility and the new facility includes an allowance to actually for the f for a contractor to remove the facility so to remove the existing shed now obviously if that's if that occurs then that comes at a cost um, what we're asking for council to consider is um, something a process before that that would allow for someone to put in a proposal to actually remove the existing shed, that would be more cost advantageous than option two. I just see exactly what I've done. I've mixed uh, should and there around the wrong way. My apologies. Dyslexic. <laughs> Thank you, Councillor. Are there any speakers for or against? Councillor Andrew. Thank you. Um, I would love to see this shed repurposed or, you know, rather than just um, dumped. Um, I wonder if we've got capacity to maybe reach out to, I don't know, men's shed's the only one that comes to mind, to see if there is some, I mean, unless you're watching tonight or in attendance or reading the agenda, uh, you probably aren't going to know that this asset um, is available. Um, so whether or not there's a way that we can put it on our Facebook or, you know, advertise it somehow, um, that it's available. Um, I'd like to see that. Thank you, Councillor. Are there any other speakers on the item? Councillor McCleary, do you wish to close? Sorry, just a, a question if I could through the chair. Is it? Sorry, I've already offered the right of reply. P apologies, Councillor, I mustn't have seen you. Councillor McCleary. Thank you, Mr President. Look, um, my understanding, this would be a public tender, so it'll be open to anyone to commit to it. Um, yeah, there's, there's a few risks of refurbishing sheds, but um, I think this is, yeah, look, public tender, it'll be open to everyone to a bid, and that'd be a men's shed, so it's probably an opportunity just to talk to those community groups whether they want to do something like that. I'll put the item to the vote. Those in favour? And that's carried unanimous. We now move to community and corporate reports. 15.1, the Dalyalup College Oval LED floodlighting upgrade program. Is there a mover for that item? Councillor Clues. Is there a seconder? Councillor Noonan. Councillor Clues. Uh, thank you. I haven't got a lot to um, say on it. Just, um, we, yeah, the, the upgrades to LEDs are a really good thing. The light's brilliant and uh, cheaper to run. All good. Councillor Noonan. Uh, yep, thanks Mr President. I, I agree wholeheartedly. Uh, a good motion. Are there any speakers against the item? Speakers for? Councillor McCleary. I think anything that gets people active in the community is pretty good and, and the night lighting is essential for the community sports in winter and I think we had a statistic some meetings back that put a, a non sort of dollar value to sporting activity. So anything that helps that, it's great. And 
I think I can see these lights from my back door. Are there any other speakers? Councillor Clues, do you wish to close? I'll put that item to the vote, those in favour. And that's carried unanimous. Item 15.2, the accounts paid during the month of October 2022. Is there a mover for those accounts? Councillor Dillon, a seconder. Councillor Andrew. Councillor Dillon. Just as presented, thank you, Mr President. Councillor Andrew. Are there any speakers for or against those accounts? Councillor Dillon, anything further? I'll put that item to the vote. Those in favour? And that's carried unanimous. Item 15.3, update on cat control measures within the Shire of Capel. Is there a mover for that recommendation? Councillor Tarantroy, a seconder. Councillor Clues. Councillor Tarantroy. I wish Rosie was here. Um, yeah, so I move this as read. I think um, this is a positive move um, and we've, we've got a lot of media coverage of this all over Facebook from ABC um, and GW, oh, was it GWN? I can't remember what, Channel 7, whatever t uh, television station it was that I, I watched the report. Um, and um, it's with pride because it's a wonderful thing that we're doing this because other other shires are also and other councils are looking to us as leading them to doing this too. I mean, we're following Fremantle, but you know this is still great. Thank you, Councillor Clues. Thank you. I'll start with a question, if I may. See, so in the list of previous council decisions, there's one from only 27th of July, 2022. Uh, I believe there would be, yes, Councillor. So, I, I don't know if I'm misunderstanding something, but that, that seems to be doing exactly what point two of this motion is. So I'm not sure what the purpose of point two is, knowing that it already exists from 27th of July, only this year. Sure. The Chief Executive Officer. Through you, Sir President. So the report that came to Council in July was uh, at the, uh, in response to a notice of motion moved by Councillor Mogg. Um, and the mo notice of motion was really focused upon understanding what the different, uh, sorry, what the Council was currently doing in relation to cat control measures um, and what the Council was currently doing, oh, sorry, the Shire was doing in relation to um, responsible ownership education. So it's really just a summary of exactly what we're existing, what we're doing currently. This report itself goes further than that and says that um, calling for an actual review of our local laws um, to see how we can amend our local laws to go further than what we're currently doing. So I'll, I'll, read, I'll read what's in front of us from 27th of July. Council requested the CEO to review the local cat control law. Yes. But you've just said that we haven't already asked for that and we are now asking for that. That was in your answer just now. Sorry. So the sort of technical interpretation is that the CEO was just to review it as in just a desktop review in-house. This is a formal authorisation for the local law to begin a proper review process and then progress down the, the path of amendment. There's a statutory process that reviewing local laws must go down. Next question. The so second part from July was that we uh, write to the state government requesting progress on reforms of the CAD Act. How, how has that gone so far? The Chief Executive Officer. Um, through you, Show President. Um, whilst we haven't written formally to the state government, we have actually raised the matter with the department and the relevant um, ministers and we also facilitated a notice of motion through the Welga Convention um, that was ultimately approved by the Welga Convention that Welga advocate for the state about a reform to the CAT Act as well. Quite sure Councillor Mogg will be at home watching and sharing my, uh, my disappointment that um, what happened in July hasn't been acted on. 
I, I don't understand. When did one council decision become formal and one become informal? A council decision was made in July requesting a review. There's no difference in what's written there to what's being written tonight, other than we're, we're being requested specifically... Councillor, you're speaking to the item now, are you? Yes? Yes. Yep. Um, th there's no formal or informal. A council decision is a council decision. This decision has already been made. Uh, and, and, and I must admit I'm a little disappointed to hear that it's now been, I guess, somewhat ignored to date because we didn't uh, make this decision. Councillor. Um, I'll call you up on that and I'll ask you to withdraw that comment. It hasn't been ignored as I've... Sorry, answered in your question. Withdraw the word ignored and replace the word uh, not enacted. My apologies. Um, so I'm not. I'm not sure if we make this decision tonight. Um, what's going to happen? And 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 if if our previous decision wasn't um, wasn't formal enough and requires reformalising tonight. Why is the entirety of the previous decision not here in front of us tonight? Why is there no mention of this letter to the, uh, the state government requesting that they get on with their job of reviewing the CAD Act that's now long overdue? Um, that we, these were the demands we made and the decision we made in July. We shouldn't have to remake the same decision. This should have happened by now. Now, it's, it's pretty pretty disappointing to be honest and uh, yeah so um, <clears throat> I think I'll move an amendment that we uh, remove part two of the officer, officer's recommendation all right an amendment's been moved by councillor clues we'll get that on the board That's your amendment on the board there, Councillor? All right. Is there a seconder to that amendment? Councillor Noonan. Councillor Clues. Thank you. Yes, um, it's pretty clear, really. We uh, made a decision only July, August, September, October, November, four months ago. Only four months ago, we already made this exact decision. Not only did we already make this exact decision, we had more to it. It was more thorough, we asked for more. Um, only four months ago. So I, we, we don't need to be coming back. Uh, if you can tell me something more formal at this shire than a council decision, I'd be, I'd be open to hear it. Um, we have formally requested this already. We have asked for a letter to be written We've asked for the review as it is worded exactly the same in what was offered to us tonight. Um, I think we don't need to be treated this way and asked to do the same thing over again. It's a waste of all our time. So uh, I think best we just get rid of it, uh, accept the fact we've already made this decision and move on. Thank you. Councillor Noonan. Uh, thank you, Councillor Clues, for the, the amendment. Um, I actually feel that um, that asking for the same thing on, on numerous occasions it actually uh, it actually enhances the urgency or the importance of it. I, I acknowledge and I, I thank the CEO and Council Clues and Councillor Mogg for their enthusiasm in, in pushing these reforms, and I think that it's a, a tr was a terrific result to get it um, brought up at the Wolga and endorsed by the, the Wolga uh, conference. I think that's a, a very positive move and it, it, it reinforces for the state government the importance of this because other shires are also pushing for similar things. Um, so I actually, I'm quite happy to formally, you know, ask, formally authorise the CEO to, um, 
to do to do this review and uh, to follow through the statutory process that needs to to go ahead to to give it uh, you know the best opportunity of getting through. So. I move for an amendment. No, you cannot, councillor. You have to wait until oh. this item is dealt with. Is there a speaker against the amendment? The deputy president. The joy of decisions and legislation is that there is the terms for interpretation. And how I interpret this amendment as it stands with the removal of point two would no longer require the CEO or the Shire and his guidance to review the CAT Act 20, uh, CAT Local Law 2017. The statement has been made that these two uh, that the decision on the 27th of July and the recommendation presented to Council tonight are exactly the same. However, this decision specifically asked the, to review a Shire of Capel local law named as the Shire of Capel Cat Local Law 2017. How I interpret the 27th of July's decision is very much in line with how the CEO has explained the actions which have been taken, which is to review the local cat control laws. The CEO, in my view, has done that and presented um, the findings to be noted by council and in those findings has made the suggestion that we, as a council, should review our local law. Okay. As for the conversation that has been then had with the, the state government, you don't write to the state government, you don't write to McGowan about cat laws, you write to the department. They are the state government. In people in charge of this. So it all comes down and completely respect that this comes down to interpretation. But if I'm putting my interpretation out there, how I read it is that the CEO with this amendment passed can leave this room having the council noted the review that he has done and does not need to enact anything further. That's what this amendment and my interpretation of this amendment would do. So don't support the amendment. What's the harm in if, if we are dead set certain, uh, hand on heart, that we've already asked for this? What's the harm, as Councillor Noonan said, in asking for it again? But I have to concur with the response given by the CEO, and this needs to remain in there because we do need to have a review of the CAT local law, um, and it is vital that we do so, and I fully support Councillor Mogg's effort to date in getting us to this point. Are there any other speakers? Councillor Tarantroy? Um, I, I, I agree with um, my um, councillor Shkiana. Sh sorry, I'm tired. <laughs> Seb, I agree with Seb. Um, for the simple fact is the difference this time is that we're formally authorising the commencement of the review, and it's actually talking specifically about the 2017. Um, and I, if 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 we remove point two, and I'm against removing point two. All we're doing is, is noting the content of a report. We're not making, we're not doing anything, we're just noting it, as Seb said. So I really think we, um, I'm against the removal of point two and um, yeah, especially after all the hard work that Rosie's done and the excitement at the conference when um, she moved this motion and I was seconded it for her. So thank you. Are there any other speakers to the amendment? Councillor Clues, you wish to close? <coughs> I'll put the amendment to the vote. Those in favour and those against. And that amendment is lost 1 7. Oops. <coughs> we now return to the original motion. Uh, Councillor Clues, you have to call. Thank you. I'd like to move an amendment, please. Uh, I'd like to. Add a point three. Uh, council, uh, sorry. The, the council reaffirms its request for the CEO to develop and deliver a responsible cat ownership program. and to write to the state government 
requesting progress on reforms to the CAD Act. Sorry, um, State Government uh, requesting progress on reforms to the CAT Act. Just ask the CEO to provide a operational point on that. I, I was sorry. I was also just thinking that perhaps instead of reaffirms, that um, formalises might be better. The chief executive officer. Our councillors, if I can just clarify as well. Um, I think part of the, I absolutely accept that part of that recommendation um, that came from the July report, uh, July decision was to write to state government, and that hasn't been, and that hasn't been actioned. I accept responsibility for that. For clarification, and it may, I think, part of the confusion, why we didn't initiate a review of the cat local laws from the July decision, um, and it might be the way I think that the summary is written in this report was that. That decision was a result of a notice of motion brought by Councillor Mogg. And in part of that, Councillor Mogg proposed that the cat local laws um, be reviewed with a consideration of a range of matters. Some of those range of matters that, counts, that Councillor Mogg was seeking was actually inconsistent with the current CAT Act and would not have been supported. In fact, the Shire of Manjimup went through an exact same process whereby they reviewed their CAT local laws that went beyond the CAT Act and it was actually rejected by the Minister. So this report outlined, if you look at this report, this report actually outlines the things that are inconsistent with the CAT Act that we, we actually can't go that far right now. So that's actually the reason why this, this is actually in there. As Point of order, Councillor. With, with all due respect, I, I feel like the CEO may be supporting the item on the table. Now, Th had, thank had you, Councillor. But I, I have asked the CEO to provide an update as to the actionability of the amendment. Can we set aside 10.1 to have a discussion? Um, Well, you've got a live amendment there that hasn't yet been seconded, so you can't move into a procedural motion yet. Mm. Right. Is there a second out to that amendment? Councillor Noonan. Councillor Clues. Thank you. I. I apologise, but um, I think that had any of those issues that may, were became inoperable that were just mentioned by the CEO uh, come to light through the review, that's what a review is for. Um, so, uh, you know, obviously it sounds like there were some quest requests made that were inoperable. Um, okay. That'll be in the review. That's what a review, you know, like I don't understand why we need another review on something we've already asked review for. It still doesn't make any sense. But the consensus clearly in the room is that we're going to do that. Uh, and the commentary was that um, we're just going to ask more formally and that it's exactly the same was the comments from several people. So cool, no problem, let's make it exactly the same then. Because these other parts that were additional were important to us only four months ago, and I think they're still important to us now. Uh, they're not inoperable. These were fine. So these couple of things that were in the initial decision only four months ago 
I think, need to stay back in this decision now uh, to make sure the whole lot's tied up together. Uh, when it comes back to us, it should all come back to us together, not spread out over several different decisions of council. So, um, yeah. Councillor Noonan. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Councillor Clues, and uh, thank you to the CEO as well for his clarification. Um, to be sure, to be sure, I, I think we we clearly we want the, this to go through. Um, on page whatever it is of the agenda, 976, it runs through the the process of making a local law um, as detailed in section 312 of the act and uh, and I appreciate that it's quite it, that it is a very formal process um, steps that have to be taken and I'm confident in the CEO and the Shire officers being able to work their way through that that process um, so that we don't suffer the same fate that uh, Manjimup um, suffered, and to be able to do it without without expending more of the staff officers' time on something that they know might is, is unlikely to um, ad advance the process. So, um, so I won't be supporting this amendment, um, although I fully support the original motion and uh, yeah thank you mr president are there any speakers against are there any speakers against the amendment speakers for <coughs> councillor clues do you wish to close thank you sorry i misunderstood obviously then what uh, my colleague had to say i think all we're asking for is that um the Shire develop a responsible cat ownership plan. It can be a pamphlet, something nice and simple to uh, hand out to residents so everyone's got the right idea about doing the right thing with their cats and um, pen a little letter to the state government. I don't know what's to not support there. That's, um, we've asked for it once already. We still want to see it. Um, should be easy done. Cheers. Put that amendment to the vote. Those in favour and those against. And that amendment is lost 1-7. So we return to the substantive item. Are there any other speakers for or against? No. Councillor Tarantroy, do you wish to close? Yeah. Uh, the, my, the, the thing that sticks out with me is um, in our attachment 15.3, um, in this shire, we only have 221 cats registered, and there are a lot more moggies out there living in residences. So I think anything that moves towards compulsory registration of, of all cats and compulsory um, and microchipping and all of that mm. sort of stuff is a good thing because it protects um, our wildlife and also um, is, a, is a pathway to responsible cat ownership. Thank you. I'll put that item to the vote. Those in favour? And that's carried unanimous. We now move to item 15.4, tender 22 slash 15, Shire of Capel asset re-evaluation. Is there a mover for that item? Councillor McCleary, a seconder, the Councillor Sciano. Councillor McCleary. I move the motion as stated. The Deputy President. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, I mean, vitally important that we reevaluate our Shire assets um, as we reevaluate the cost of many things. I'm just, um, and I'm looking at the attachment A, item 15.3, which there is a physical copy on our desk. Um, there is just one line of information that I feel that is perhaps um, omitted from this attachment. Oh, sorry. I'm so you're, you're right. on the wrong item there, Councillor. I'm looking at the assess um, revaluation. I won't talk about that, but I will just support the... Um, I will simply support the officer's recommendation. 
All right, are there any other speakers for or against the item? <clears throat> yeah, it, it is. We are 15.4. The, number uh, the numbers, no, the numbers just out of whack. So, apologies for that confusion. But we are 15.4. Are there any other speakers to the item? Councillor McClure, just to close. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Um, yeah, look, concur with uh, Councillor Sciardo that we need to revalue our assets from time to time. They're used a lot in our ratios in performance, so I think it's important we know what we're dealing with. I'll put that item to the vote. Those in favour? And that's carried unanimous. Item 15.5, the financial statements for the 30th of September 2022. Is there a mover? Councillor Andrew. A seconder? Councillor Noonan. Councillor Andrew. Councillor Noonan. Any discussion? Councillor Andrew, anything further? I'll put that item to the vote. Those in favour? That's carried unanimous. Item 15.6, policy review volunteers. Is there a remover for that recommendation? Councillor Tarantroy. A seconder. Councillor Noonan. Councillor Tarantroy. Moved as read. Councillor Noonan. No, nothing good. Are there any speakers against the item? Speakers for? Councillor Clues. Thank you. Some questions, please. Um, firstly, <coughs> pardon me, will this policy go for every single uh, volunteer in the Shire's employ? Yeah, they might just do the same thing. We timed out. Do you want to borrow one go. of my? There you go. All right, I'm back on. All right. So, sorry, could you please repeat your question, Councillor? Will, will this policy, uh, will, will every single volunteer in the Shire's employee come under this policy? Um, my understanding is that people who volunteer within the Shire of Capel would be eligible, subject to the criteria in the policy. What do you mean, be eligible? If it so there is eligibility criteria. Are there, are there any volunteers in the Shire, for the Shire, that won't come under this policy? <coughs> I'm just, what do you mean by for the Shire? Well, if they're under the direction of management of, um, guidance of... If there's other decisions that Council has made, in terms of any payment regarding any position, they would still be captured by that. But I believe there is a clause in this policy that would then rule them ineligible to apply for this policy. Oh, okay. Cool. So, so will this will the will this policy then be transferred over to uh, match any other conflicting policies? Uh, I'll make an example yeah. to make it easier so it's understood. We, um, we currently have, uh, so number seven here I'm looking at about the out-of-pocket expenses. Um, I'm just curious if that particular section will be available to all volunteers and all volunteers will have to fall in line with that section. The Director of Community and Corporate. Hello, thank you for your question, Councillor, through the chair. Um, I see where you're going with this. Um, basically, this What's is... An aspiration? <laughs> this is a standalone policy for volunteers. Oh, yes. And like with anything else, um, any um, remuneration will be vetted under this in line with any other re remuneration that's given to volunteers in any other capacity they work in the Shire. Perfect, thank you very much. Should have just gone to Sam straight away. Are there any other speakers for uh, Councillor Andrew? Thank you. Um, a question. Um, 
So, because I feel like I know where Dave is going as well, um, the honorarium payments that are paid annually that are subject to another um, policy, but it's still in regards to volunteers, that policy now seems at odds with this one mm -hmm. and they conflict. So which policy is going to be applicable to those volunteers? The Director of Community and Corporate. The, probably what I would like to draw your attention to is that before any honorarium is agreed through the draft annual budget process, that will come to council. So you will get an opportunity to see it and see if there's any linkages to any other volunteers that's fit under any other policy within the Shire. But that's not the intention of this policy. This policy is to stand alone. Through you, Shire President, if I can just add the intention of, yes. that, no. the, of any existing policy that supports any other volunteers through an honorarium is intended to sit alongside this policy. Ultimately, if a volunteer um, applies for applies for um, through this policy, we would take in we through that assessment process and recommendation process to council. We would take into account any payment they got either through sh through the shire in another form, or even through their own agency be, um, through some of the support that's provided to volunteers through through their own agencies as well, i.e. St John's and those types of things. So all of that information would be part of the assessment process and part of the consideration that we would provide to council. So it's not intended that anyone is allowed to double dip, if I can say that. So I have a follow-up question. So can we view the assessment criteria and policy that you've just described that you will use? The Director of Community and Corporate. Thank you for your question. Through the Chair, in the officer's report, um, it does indicate what the assessment criteria would look like. Um, it's on page 206. So this would provide the framework in terms of how we would um, consider the applications or advertised applications and it's the intention that this application process would run alongside the normal budget request, community budget request application process um, and then the nominations that come through for both the community budget requests and the honorarium requests for volunteers would come to council at the same time. So if I could, I feel like there's a bit of a disconnect. I understand that um, the honorarium payment in this policy um, is going to be discre somewhat discretionary and so we can we can say well no you're getting the honorarium payment there mm -hmm. so you can't get it here that wasn't my prob my issue my issue is more about the reimbursements that are covered under here so can volunteers that get the honorarium still put in receipts to have their um, expenses reimbursed? The Director of Community and Corp. Um, yes, because expenses would be incurred by the volunteer through the year. Who's to say that they, the ones who had incurred expenses and been reimbursed, would be eligible for the honorarium or chosen by council to receive the honorarium? If they've had expenses incurred, that's through the course of the duty of being a volunteer. This is, I suppose, um, a subsidiary of what an offer is on behalf of council to recognise um, their duty to the community. So what about, sorry, through the chair, what about though the volunteers that get the annual honorarium that has nothing to do with this policy, they don't go through some um, assessment or eligibility criteria. They get it each year by default because of the position that they have. Can they get the honorarium under that specific policy that provides it to them? 
and can they then also claim this policy for reimbursement? As the CEO just explained, these policies sit side by side. They're not um, exclusive to each other. The Chief Executive Officer. Through you, Shire, uh, through you, Shire President. So the honorariums that might be paid through some other mechanism will occur. It won't stop that volunteer from applying through this process. However, that would take any honorarium that they would receive for doing the same thing would be taken into account in the assessment process and our recommendation to council in terms of whether or not we would support an honorarium under this process. And the answer would probably be that we wouldn't recommend supporting it on the basis that they've already received an honorarium for doing exactly the same thing. Sorry, you're still not understanding. So people though in this policy aren't nominating themselves as I read it, they're getting nominated by someone else. So forget about forget about the honorarium that's in this policy. I get that. You can't get both. What I want to know is, is can people that get an annual honorarium out of another volunteer's policy, can they then also claim their reimbursement of expenses? Because nothing in this policy says that if you're in receipt of an honorarium because you hold position blah, 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 you're ineligible to claim your expenses. Yeah, I suppose there's a couple of ways that could be, could be interpreted as if it was an elected member who was then volunteering. Or are you also meaning someone who may volunteer that covers an area larger than just the Shire of Capel and they may be receiving something from another local government or entity and then claiming that same expense from the local government here as well? No, neither. Neither? I'm talking about the honorarium payments that get paid to our Chief Bushfire Officer and the Deputy. They get an automatic annual honorarium under All a right. specific policy. So if these policies sit side by side and aren't <coughs> exclusive to each other, can they claim that and then claim under this policy all their expenses? The Governance and Risk Coordinator. Sorry, hi. I understand the question. Your answer is no. So what you're thinking of the out-of-pocket expenses, the honorariums that you're referring to is actually to cover their expenses that's incurred from the role that they do. So this is a completely separate one. So the policy that is created for that specific um, position, well, those po um, specific positions is a sta it, it is a standalone for them only. So they will not be claiming within this policy. So my problem then in, with this policy is that nowhere does it say that they're excluded. So, Your question, Councillor Andrew? Was it a question or are you you're talking the, to the item? So if this policy is designed to not be applicable to them, then it needs to say that. The, the officers can provide a, an amendment to an elected member <laughs> who may wish to move so. Through you, Shire President, if I can recommend that maybe yep. what Councillor Andrew is seeking is potentially in a new point 14 of, uh, that effectively says that um, any honorarium paid through another policy of Council um, would not be eligible to receive support under this policy. All right. So, uh, Councillor Andrew, you've only asked questions, you haven't spoken to the item, so I take it you are going to move that amendment? Yes. Yes? All right. So, amendment moved by Councillor Andrew. 
So a new point 14. We'll get that on the board. I'll just so I'll just keep a bit of order in the chamber. I'll just Council Andrew. Councillor Andrew. Sure. Are you happy with that amendment, Councillor? All right. Is there a second to that amendment, Councillor McCleary? Councillor Andrew. Councillor McCleary. Thank you, Mr. President. I think this gives a bit more clarity to the process and um, saves us a bit of an issue down the track. Is there a speaker against the amendment? A question, Councillor? Yes. Oh, speaker against? Yep. Thank you. Yeah, I actually, I'm sorry, but I think this needed to specify monies received by hon honorarium could not be reimbursed by this policy because as it is at the moment if we have someone receiving an honorarium then going on to volunteer somewhere else and do something else and incur costs um, that would have been eligible under this policy they now won't be able to have it reimbursed because we've struck them out by naming the party instead of naming the cost so uh, yeah, I think that, you know, uh, as far as this whole thing goes, I think the, the, the I think the gist of it was clear and already the, the staff would have made happen what our intention was. Um, but this actually takes any ability for someone to run two roles a, a, away, which um, I don't think we should be doing. If we have a, yeah, like I say, if we have a, someone getting an honorarium and then volunteering somewhere else uh, and incurring a separate and additional cost. Uh, you can question as long as it's not a statement question. So, where <laughs> so whether or not there's a better way to word that, because what Councillor Clues has just said was not my intention sure. of the amendment. There would be, the easiest process would be just to um, vote this amendment down and then someone just move a new one accommodating those, those matters. All right, so are there any speakers on this amendment? The Deputy President. Because I, w sorry, thank you, Mr. President, because I would like to point something out which could um, clarify some of this. In, in point seven, it says volunteers are not expected to incur out-of-pocket expenses while assisting the council. So if how I read that is that if someone receiving an honorarium, not naming who, then goes and does some work for the Boy and Up Lions, they're not eligible for reimbursement in this policy. They're not eligible. This, this policy doesn't reimburse someone who's volunteering for a community organisation. What it does do is allow a community organisation who to recognise someone who does do an exceptional amount of work and um, suggest them for honorarium up to $500, a one-off payment. But the out-of-pocket expenses um, of what is in point seven is while assisting the council. So when I used to do in zone back in the day, though I never did it, 
um, is to volunteer in zone. I would probably have been eligible to say, oh, I had to, um, you know, drive somewhere to, to help out and I drove my own car. But, but I mean, all of this is, and bush and the bushfire brigade conversation does kind of come into that because they are volunteers assisting the council because they are, the bushfire brigades are a council managed asset. But um, if they want to go out and help a, another, that's, now for some reason the bushfire brigade officer wants to go and um, help at the in zone activities, they may, they, okay, yes, they would be ineligible, I think, as per what Councillor Clues has pointed out with the wording. But I think there seems to be a, um, a misunderstanding that this is applicable to people outside of volunteering for the Shire. If you're volunteering for the Shire, then you can get reimbursement. If you're volunteering for your local community group or your, the country club, you can't. So just thought that that may help with the discussion around eligibility. All right, are there any other speakers on the amendment? Does the mover wish to close? I'll put the amendment to the vote. Those in favour? Those against? That amendment is lost unanimous. Okay, we now remove, return to the substantive motion. Are there any councillor clues? I think I only asked questions and haven't yes, spoken to Yes, you've only asked it. questions, yes. Thank you. Um, can we get... Oh, just a shot there. Point seven. So, I think, to be honest, the whole thing's already covered by the point itself. Um, and, and I don't think it's necessary because the end, the last line of point seven, there is an internal process to follow in reviewing and reimbursing out of pocket expenses. There's no automatic, uh, you bring me a receipt, you're going to get the money. It will be reviewed before being reimbursed reimbursed at every account so it's for the staff to go hey hang on we've already paid for that <laughs> we're not going to go and pay again so to be honest I, I think this whole thing's already covered off and, and and we don't need to carry on anymore are there any other speakers for or against the item councillor tarantroy do you wish to close debate Yes, just by saying I'm glad that we came back to point seven to clarify that this is only for volunteers for the council, not for any volunteer um, organisation. Thank you. I'll put the item to the vote. Those in favour? And that's carried unanimous. Item 16, new business of an urgent nature. There is none. We move to public question time. Are there any public questions? <laughs> there being no people present in the public gallery, uh, we'll move on to item 18, motions without notice. No. Are there any motions for consideration at the next ordinary meeting of the council? No. All right, we'll move on to item 20.1, but before we do, I will move that the meeting be closed to the members of the public in accordance with the Shire of Capel Standing Orders Local Law 2016 12.1G to consider a confidential item. A seconder, Councillor Clues. All those in favour? And that's carried. Unanimous.
right. Now that we've returned from behind closed doors, I can confirm that the Council endorsed the officer's recommendation 20.1, that the title of Honorary Freeman of the Shire of Capel be conferred, two, that the Chief Executive Officer be requested to arrange a formal conferral ceremony, and three, that the, confident, that the conferral remains confidential until the ceremony is held. There being no further business on tonight's agenda, I'll declare the meeting closed at 10.03 p.m. Thank you very much for those who attended and those who may still be watching online. Thank you.